grateful for this day and we hope that next year we could continue working toward raising the awareness of the importance of all indigenous native communities that are here present. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, I really do appreciate you capturing the, the, the diversity of the indigenous community uh, so much better than I, than I possibly could have. I really do mm -hmm. appreciate that. Um, it's very important that we, that we, uh, we, we name everyone. Thank you. Uh, and, and last we have with us, uh, again, our young student leader uh, here, Bryce, who really took the initiative in, in, uh, in pushing the city of Fresno to, to recognize and reclaim uh, Indigenous Peoples Day here within the city. It's always the young folks, right, who are, who are uh, the catalysts. Uh, and so I wanted to give Bryce an opportunity to, to say a few words before we uh, read the proclamation out loud. Bryce, you have the floor. Oh, Bryce, I think you're, you're muted. Now, now unmute. So you're connected to the audio, but now unmute. Good. Excellent. Okay. Uh, thank you, President Arias, Council Member Esparza, uh, distinguished California Native American tribal leaders and indigenous peoples of the Central Valley. My name is Bryce Herrera, and I have previously served as the president and CEO. Is there an echo? You're an echo. A little bit of an echo, but we're getting through it. We, we can certainly hear you. Um, Bryce, yeah. you have two um, devices on. You'll have to turn the device you are not using off or put it on mute. We'll give uh, Bryce just a second here. I think he's trying to uh, reconcile the, uh, the audio. Okay, so try the other device, unmute, and then the one that you can see your video on, try turning your volume all the way down and see if that works. Yeah, I'll, I'll just go with that. All right. All right. Thank you, President. Thank you. Thank you. I was council member as far as the distinguished California Native American tribal leaders and indigenous people in the Central Valley. My name is Brett Fester. Oh, Bryce, you went on mute. You went on mute. I apologize. I apologize. You don't happen to have a headphone? Maybe a headphone was... Uh, clerk, while, uh, while Bryce uh, figures out his audio situation, um, would you do us the honor of actually reading the, the proclamation into the record? I have it here. It's a little tough to, to see, uh, but uh, we can go ahead and do that while he figures out his audio. No problem. Whereas the city of Fresno takes great pride in its diversity contributions of all groups in our rich history, 
The city of Fresno and the greater Central Valley are home to many Native American communities, including the Yuk, Yokut people, Mono tribe, and Miwoks tribe. Our region sits on a traditional and ancestral land. The Valley Native Americans survived using natural resources that they could find in Central Valley. They um, lived in the valley and in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And whereas the city of Fresno recognizes the great contributions Native American tribe, indigenous communities have made to our city. In, this, in making this proclamation, we honor indigenous peoples around the world who have found thousands of years in their respective communities since before European arrival. Our collective identity as a nation has, involved, has evolved from the contributions of indigenous people in innovation, entrepreneurship, leadership, all of which have advanced our society. The city of Fresno wishes to strengthen our community through recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day. And whereas in making this pro proclamation, we pay respect to cultures and populations that existed before European contact. We celebrate contributions of all Indigenous people um, to the culture of diversity, innovation, resilience, and has marked California as a leader. We celebrate the acts of resistance and persistence that have shaped experiences of indigenous communities since first contact with the Europeans. The indigenous people of California preserved through our state's shameful history, including the uh, genocidal war of extermination. California preserves through our state's shameful history, including the genocidal war of extermination directed by California's first governor, and whereas we wish to celebrate and recognize this day as Indigenous Peoples Day in the city of Fresno. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Council Member Nelson Esparza, Mayor Lee Brand, and the Fresno City Council do hereby proclaim the 15th of October to be Indigenous Peoples Day in the city of Fresno. Thank you, Clerk. Very, very much appreciated. Uh, Bryce, uh, have, would you still like to say a couple words before we, uh, before we move on? Yeah, we're, 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 still, not, we're still not hearing you. Um, Council okay, Member Sparsa? Yes. I have a question for you. Does this mean that every um, Indigenous People's Day from now on on the 15th will be declared that in the city of Fresno or was that just for today? Because I know other cities have declared it permanently and I think that that's probably, that would be a great gesture for this city um, to stay, um, take a step forward in declaring every single year um, that it is Indigenous Peoples Day. I, uh, I have to double check with the, the city attorney on, on the precise meeting, but I, if it's not codified, it's certainly something that um, this body, the council body, should uh, should consider codifying uh, uh, into our uh, as again a continuous uh, celebration. Uh, so today was the the beginning, um, but I would agree with you, Council Member Soria, um, that uh, it, the celebration should continue and it should be recognized each year. Um, yes. Thank you. All right, Bryce, we'll give you one last uh, last shot here, and hopefully your, your audio is on, because we think we have to, the council president's on me to move the meeting along, but uh, please uh, go ahead. It's okay if it echoes a bit. Um, I think everyone can hear you. Except now we can't hear you, no. Well, uh, can you hear me now? Oh yeah, there you go, that's perfect. Okay. Um, So my name is Bryce Ferrer and I've, I've served as the president and CEO of the Native American Student Association of Fresno State and held uh, various leadership um, roles throughout my college career. And today's proclamation is the culmination of the professional work, leadership, community efforts that many before us uh, have dedicated decades towards bold campaigns for change. Contrary to the recent position taken by the White House, October 12th will always be Indigenous Peoples Day. Although this proclamation by Council Member Esparza is a big step, there remains crucial work to close socioeconomic, educational, health, civil, and criminal justice equity gaps affecting our Indigenous communities here in Fresno. My hope is that in recognizing the contributions 
resilient spirit and conviction of the Native American people as have a multitude of different cities and states in their respective regions to the city of Fresno, the state of California, and the United States, this government will resolve to acknowledge a renewed sense of purpose to work closely alongside California Native American tribal sovereignties and North American indigenous peoples, local educational institutions, and local nonprofits like Fresno American Indian Health Project, CVDIO, El Dorado Park Community Development Corporation, and others to ensure the successful creation and implementation of essential native serving programs and services. If we do this work together, the result will be one that will have a direct and positive impact on our indigenous communities and will guarantee that indigenous families thrive and ultimately achieve the promise of the American dream. When indigenous peoples succeed, we all do. Thank you again for this opportunity to address the council and I look forward to continuing this work with all of you. Thank you, Bryce. Very much appreciated. And again, thank, thank you to all our guests, those of you who spoke, as well as those of you who, uh, who simply attended. Uh, I think today was historic and again, simply the beginning. Uh, take care, everyone. Great to have you. Thank you, Council Vice President. Um, the next presentation is a proclamation and appreciation of our code enforcement officers. As you can imagine, uh, 2020 has been completely different for our rank and file in the code enforcement department, not only did they go under new leadership, but they are at the front front, at the forefront of uh, enforcement during this pandemic, which is not an easy task. Many other jurisdictions have chosen to look the other way and not risk confrontation. Our code enforcement officers have stepped forward and actually kept us safe um, by making sure that egregious violators are held accountable and by ensuring that those businesses and residents who need masks get them in a timely fashion, and they have the sanitation supplies and the PPE supplies to operate their businesses in accordance with the state order. Uh, so with that, I want to turn it over to Doug. Erica, you can come on up. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the code enforcement employees. There are about 90 people upstairs, including lawyers, uh, investigators, inspectors, uh, managers, supervisors, laborers, uh, administrators, and accountants. Uh, together, they make uh, all of the code enforcement happen. Their job is to help keep the community health, healthy and safe and eliminate blight. Uh, they do an incredible job. They're hardworking, uh, and they're very responsive to when they get a request to go fix something. Uh, the vast majority of what they do is actually education. Uh, they're in the field trying to help people do the right thing and tell them what they need to be doing, and they've done a fantastic job of that. So their leader upstairs is Chief Assistant City Attorney Erica Cambrina, and she's up next here. Thank you so much, uh, Council President Arias, council members, and to everybody who has supported our code enforcement officers over the past year. Um, we all know that this time during COVID has been extremely trying for everyone, but it has been especially challenging for our code enforcement officers who, since the inception of COVID, have um, been deemed essential employees. They have been reporting to work every single day, continuing to enforce our traditional code as well as the emergency orders put in place. Um, they, and in that process, they assisted with first shutting down the city, then they assisted with reopening the city, and they've been working with hundreds of businesses to reopen safely. And in that process, as Doug mentioned, they've been educating the community, distributed thousands and thousands of masks, um, we have now moved into conducting housing inspections virtually, and they've done it just with a great attitude. And unfortunately, while there are so many people in this country who are losing their jobs because of COVID, we here in Fresno are proud to say that we have been able to maintain our code enforcement officers, keep them employed, busy, and very productive. Uh, we've all heard the saying, all roads lead to code, and I just can stand here and tell you I am so happy that my road led me here to lead a remarkable group of code enforcement officers. And we so look forward to working with the next administration, especially with respect to strengthening our relationship with the community. And so if I could just take a couple more seconds to address our code enforcement officers directly, because they are all tuned in and watching right now from remote locations, either teleworking in the office or out in the field. I don't know where I'm supposed to be looking, if I'm supposed to be looking yeah. there. Um, but in any event, I just want them to know that we all recognize what you do. 
You go out in there and you address and confront businesses and individuals who are in violation of the city's laws, and most of the time they're not happy to see us. But you do it, you do it with pride, you maintain your professionalism, you constantly go out there with this level of confidence, and you are tested every day, and you pass those tests, and we are just so proud of you. And because of you, we are all safer. Um, and so, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I got too tired. Um, so anyways, we just, we're here to thank you, recognize you, we, we, we respect you, and today we honor you. Thank you so much for your dedication and commitment to the city. Thank you. Hey, Doug, uh, I want to include my congratulations to you and your team. Uh, I don't know, I'm a little confused. They say the quality of the performance starts at the top, but I'm not so sure. I think it starts in the middle and maybe the bottom. So I guess I'd have to say that the entire group of code enforcement that you guys have uh, put together and been so effective, uh, District 4 has never been better, and it's because of you and your team and the coordination and the effort and the commitment. It's not just a job to the code enforcement people I've encountered, it's not a job, it's a passion. They love our city, they want to improve it, and they're doing a great job. So please keep up the good work and let me know if I can help you in any way. Thank you much. I just want to say ditto. I am very pleased with just the quality of work that is happening and how responsive folks are. So to all our code enforcement, thank you for being the boots on the ground, um, for being the eyes and ears of the city, um, and for ensuring that the quality of life, especially in those more challenging neighborhoods, are at least kept to a level that is um, decent so that folks can enjoy and feel good about where they live at. So thank you for the work that you guys continuously do and um, for serving the community. Yeah, I, I would, Eric, I'd like to say um, similar things. Uh, code enforcement has a very difficult job. And uh, sometimes you also have to do things that uh, uh, we give you as a policy to do, uh, like over these last uh, many months, and it's not an easy task, but you do it, and you do it well, and uh, you are serving uh, the citizens well in tough times, in very tough times. And so I appreciate that, and I've witnessed uh, code enforcement uh, when they've been out, and they are professional. They're always professional. Uh, I've, ex I've seen it and, uh, and witnessed it. So. To all the uh, code, uh, keep doing a good job. It's a tough, a tough job in tough times and difficult circumstances, and, and the city of Fresno greatly appreciates it. All right, Council. Member Carbossi. Uh, Mr. President, thank you for bringing this item forward. Uh, to the city attorney, to Mrs. Camarena, uh, and especially to the folks in your department. How many times do I email you a week with a code issue? This is a very, very, very big part of our arsenal to be able to help residents in our community. Nobody in this community should live with black mold. Nobody should live with the kind of subpar conditions that have existed in the past. And you are a huge part of north, south, east, west, making sure our neighborhoods are livable. There's a lot of pride. And you make, you really do genuinely make a difference in the lives of our residents in the city of Fresno. Um, I'm so blessed to have you. Thank you so much. I know it's been a tough time, but I just want to remind people, the, the goal of code isn't finding, it's compliance. That's always been the goal, education and compliance. So thank you. You are a superstar. You're a department. You're, I know we can't have a big party for you right now because of COVID, but we really are celebrating, and we are very, very grateful for what you do. It's not easy. Sometimes some people get mad at you, too, and, and there have been, unfortunately, attacks on some of our code enforcement officers. But we are going to defend you, and we're here for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council. Um, Those are all the comments. We'll move on. City of Maryland, please. I'm a resident. Oh, sorry, Council Disparza. Don't forget about the Wizard of Oz up here. <laughs> um, so, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I'll keep it brief. I just echo the sentiments of my, uh, of my, my colleagues. Uh, I mean, the, the work that Code Enforcement puts in day in, day out, I mean, it, it, can, be, it can be grueling, but I think, uh, you know, from my, what I've heard from our, our personnel also rewarding, right, and just, you know, uh, upholding the standards we have citywide, and especially in my district, has one of the older housing stocks uh, within uh, within the city, making sure we uphold those standards for uh, for our residents, among the many other functions um, that you execute for us on a, on a daily basis. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you. Are those all the comments? All right, council. With that, we're going to move on to the next 
portion of the uh, agenda. Um, if I can ask our city employees um, who are in the chambers if they can exit so we can make room for the members of the public who are here to discuss a, an item on the agenda. And as you know, we have to sanitize every chair um, in order for people to sit down. And we can all also request that the security allow members of the public in the chambers um, as we're gonna begin the discussion of the item that they're here to address. Um, secondly, council, there was previously an item on, on the consent calendar that required a closed session discussion first. That item was tabled from the agenda till next week. So instead of commencing to closed session, we're gonna continue with consent um, and we will start with item 2L, Councilwoman, and then we'll proceed with item 2O, which we have members of the public here to address. So Councilwoman, I will turn over to you as you pulled item 2L. Uh, can I, a point of order, um, we, ha we haven't adopted the consent calendar yet, right? That's correct, we need to do oh. that. So we should probably do, that, do that before we discuss it. Sorry. Let's, uh, do you have a motion to ad adopt the consent calendar? So moved. Second. And I, now, these are the items pulled. Well, yeah, we gotta take a vote, but I, I'm gonna register a no vote on okay. um, 2D, D as in David. So let the record show that 2D as in David is a registered no vote from the council member Bredefield. And the consent calendar includes all items on consent except for 2L, 2O, 2BB, 2CC, 2DD, 2EE, 2II. So city clerk, will you do a roll call for the remainder items on consent? I'm sorry, Mr. President, also for me, uh, 2D, register no vote. All right, we have two no votes on 2D as in David from member Carbasi and member Bredefield. Before we go to an official vote of the consent, is there any member of the public wishing to address the consent items left on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll come back to the dais. Roll call, please. Council member Bredefield? Yes. Council member Chavez? Yes. Council member Esparza? Aye. Council member Carbasi? Yes. Council Member Soria? Yes. Council Vice President Capriolio? Yes. And President Arias? Yes. Councilwoman, you have the floor with 2L. You know, I might suggest, uh, if I may interrupt for a second, it's 10 o'clock. Uh, I think these timed items might be uh, quick, quickly resolved before the public comes in and we'd be on time. 10 o'clock item on page 11, there's a 1015. Just uh, a novel thought. I'm told the 1015 item was actually noticed for 1030, so we should okay. do that. So let's just hold off for the time items. Let's get through these um, pulled items first. Councilwoman, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President. So I know that I had um, pulled it pr from a previous council meeting, um, this item, and I wanted to, I know that over the last couple weeks since we've right. pulled it, additional yeah. folks had um, claim their unclaimed checks or unclaimed dollars. So what I'd like to do is maybe recommend that the unclaimed checks from 2000 to 2015 be transferred as recommended by staff, but that we um, continue to allow those from 2015, so in the last five years, allow them additional time to claim their unclaimed checks. That's thousands of dollars, and I think that um, if we can just continue to promote it, I know with just myself promoting it online and with us, um, with the media covering it a little bit more, we were able to give out, I believe, at least $60,000 in the last couple weeks. So I'd like to make the motion to- um, Second. To do that. Do you have a time certain in which you would w hope that we continue to reach out to folks? Well, if we can just, I think, put it on social media, hopefully we can do another um, press release and then next year we could bring it back and if we want to re release it's the last five years I don't see why that couldn't be done Mike do you have any concerns <clears throat> good morning council Mike Lima finance director um, you know the checks have been sitting around 20 years so what's another six months you know <laughs> but at some point we we like that response <laughs> but at some point you know, you gotta Which is why I said the last five years, I think that we should still continue to advertise. We can, those that have been sitting around for 20 years, that's fine, right? Mm -hmm. 
but I think that it's sensible enough to say, hey, there are a still unclaimed checks for the last five years. Let's continue to try to at least for another six months figure out if people. In the last couple of weeks that I did the promotion, we had over sixty thousand dollars claimed, and so that that means that the notification. I, I believe, council, if you guys go on to the agenda uh, to the staff report, you guys will see the notice. The notice is very hard. Like for just the average person to go and, and look, it's, it's hard to identify. So I think there was value in us delaying, there was value in us promoting it, so I don't see why for the last five years that it remain, you can get rid of the other ones that have been sitting there for 20 years, so that would be my motion. So what you're proposing is anything 2015 years or older, keep we, we, you will, it's cheat, and then anything from that, we will try again on that. Yeah, right so in the last five years, we'll try to get those out, see if people will claim them. All the old ones you can. Previous time? Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Just, okay. Yeah, if that's the motion, yeah. We can just want to, not trying to be problematic here, but just want to ask a question. So, Mike, of the checks that were, were claimed, how many were under five years versus over five years? I just want to make sure we're not, you know, cutting ourselves off too early. I don't have that breakdown of, you know, which were before or which were after five years. Or we can we keep can them that. open. We can always keep all of them open and just continue to advertise. I think that the fact that in the last two weeks people, you know, people claimed about $60,000 of it, I think that that's telling. I, I think uh, maybe we should look at what the aging of, of the ones that were claimed were picked up and then pick that target. So then should we bring this item back for the next council meeting? I don't think it's time sensitive, is it? No. Do you want to change your motion to table for next week? Yeah, meeting? so if we want to take a look at that and, and provide a better proposal in terms of given, you know, the returns that you guys just recently did, I'm happy to do that. I'll so. second the tabling. All right, the motion and second to table the item. There's Thank no you. discussion on this um, table. We're tabling the item, so please roll call, please. Council Member Bertifel? Yes. Councilmember Chavez? Yes. Councilmember Esparza? Aye. Councilmember Carbasi? Yes. Councilmember Soria? Council Vice President Capriolio? Yes. President Arias? Yes. Thank you, Council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lima. Before we get to the next item, um, Assistant City Manager Jim, we have about eight people still outside getting, trying to uh, be allowed in through security. There is about 10 available seats in social distancing. Can we make sure that they are allowed in yeah. to the chambers? Yeah, there's plenty of uh, seats that are designated for seating on top and on bottom. Okay. Thank you, Council Courtney. President. Council President, what item are we going to hear? Uh, we're gonna hear item 2O, the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act. If I could um, start off with the motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve the Responsible Neighborhood Act with the following direction, that staff initiate a revision of the Fresno Municipal Code Section 156704 to update and refine the definitions of grocery stores, including the terms general market and healthy foods grocer to foster and accommodate future development of grocery stores with a footprint of less than 10,000 10, square feet by establishing a steering committee of stakeholders and members of the public in consultation with the council and the mayor for the council's consideration. Is there a second, second. for the motion? I'll second that. Second by Councilmember Sparza. And as people take their seats, let me just start with some opening comments and acknowledgements of this item. First, allow me to thank, thank the young people, the residents and small business owners that have worked with Councilmember Chavez and Councilmember Sparza and I for the last 22 months to arrive at this stage. To the young people joining us today, virtually and in person. Thank you for not giving up on our city, which is your city. You have been educating, advocating, and collaborating with the city since 2012. This is your win, and our future is better because of your leadership. To the residents, we heard you loud and clear, especially after some of us knock on thousands of doors to um, get elected. For years, you have tried to fight the growing alcohol saturation in your neighborhoods. This is why over a thousand of you contacted us via email, petition, or in person to express your support for this ordinance. You didn't need to spend thousands of dollars on mailers or misinformation because 
you had something better, the will of the people and the residents of our city. To our small businesses, we heard you too. The saturation has pushed the prices of alcohol lower than water, making many business owners indentured servants. Advocate members, you stepped up and agreed to be held accountable, even if it meant losing your conditional use permits. Not one time in the 18 months of developing this ordinance for the city um, did you ever ask for a self-interest exception. As a city, we have spent decades approving more than 500 alcohol licenses next to schools, parks, and each other, making Fresno the drunkest city in America. Then we wonder why so many DUI checkpoints were necessary, why thousands of people end up in jail, and worst of all, while so many are killed by drunk drivers, and why our families continue to be surrounded by alcohol. This tragedy we hope to end today. Finally, a, hand of, a, hand, a handful of individuals who have engaged in some mis misinformation in the last few weeks about this ordinance, we heard you too. In several meetings, for several hours, we listened, we considered your, your special interest amendments, but the truth is, now is not the time for more self-interest. No matter how passionate or well-funded, our city is hurting with record shootings and the added strain of a recession and a pandemic. Now it's a time for everyone to step up and do what's in our power to prevent the cycle that ends with so many calls for police services in these establishments. The community has spoken, and we need to honor them today with the approval of the ordinance. In order to ensure this process continues to be informed by residents, we fully recognize that no ordinance brought forward to this council is perfect. It's a process of refinement, it's a process of improvement. And for that reason, we're gonna immediately convene a committee, an advisory committee to begin revising the grocery store municipal code. The end goal is to build on our current incentives to attract more grocery stores into our neighborhoods. Grocery stores is what residents want not convenience stores, not liquor stores, not just more gas stations with alcohol and liquor. They're looking for grocery stores. And we're gonna ask the public, stakeholders, the experts in those industries to come and work with us over the next few months to develop that additional um, ability to attract them. So in short, this ordinance is a critical piece of a larger plan to rebuild a healthy Fresno that so many of you have been asking for for years. And I want to simply conclude my opening comments with, I know why this has not been done for decades. The easiest thing is to continue to say yes to every single applicant who wants to make a larger profit margin by poisoning our neighborhoods with the fifth, the 10th, and the 12th alcohol license in a zip code that's supposed to have two. It's the easiest thing to say yes, um, to find a public convenience excuse, to find a job creation excuse. The difficult thing is to understand deeply the industry, which we have spent 22 months understanding. It's also difficult, difficult to recognize and to appreciate the fact that it's complex and we have the livelihoods of businesses in our hands and we also have the quality of our neighborhoods. Everyone um, starts off with the hope and the presentation that their business is gonna add value to the community. And over time, sometimes as quick as one or two years across the street, it becomes an attraction for nuisance, for crime, for shootings, for human feces, out in the open. And it has been a task for us to tackle this. And I personally now can appreciate why it hasn't been done before. It's extremely difficult and it's also extremely difficult to withstand the political pressure of well-funded opposition and individual interest who want to water down a comprehensive policy to meet the needs of a few. And I, I want to personally thank my colleagues for the patience. The city attorneys have spent more than 22 months at the table with us, the small businesses, and the youth who have told us time and time again, like our residents have told us, we don't need one more liquor store. We don't need one more convenience store that offers the same product and the same outcomes in our neighborhoods. 
Um, it's been a long road, uh, and I want to thank the council and turn it over to my co-sponsors of the ordinance, council member uh, Chavez and council member Esparza. We'll go with council member Esparza first, if you don't mind, uh, uh, incoming president. Yep, that works. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Council President. I think you captured, uh, captured the sentiments very, very well. Uh, the legislation before us, you know, wasn't uh, dreamt up yesterday. It's uh, about a year, over a year now, of uh, grueling over policy, uh, trying to figure out the best way to accomplish the goal of reducing the number of alcohol licenses, liquor licenses within the city, off-site specifically. Uh, and so a lot of thought went into this. There were a lot of different approach approaches. Uh, certainly uh, was more than one way to skin this cat. Um, but again, taking into consideration the number of factors and the livelihoods of the existing business owners in our district, this is really the solution that we ultimately uh, came up with. Uh, what we're seeing here is uh, essentially the, the cap and trade uh, version of uh, alcohol licenses. We're certainly going to cap the market and, and create a new market for these liquor licenses. And so we've taken a really a market-based approach to, to reducing uh, this number. Uh, you know, folks, some of the detractors have, you know, talked about the lack of data on alcohol consumption and, and how that might be impacted. But what it's really about is the, uh, the point of the alcohol consumption of the off-site licenses, the impacts they have on the neighborhood, uh, and, and the access that our, our youth have had uh, for far too long. And, and so I'm extremely proud today to, to take a stand uh, and, and vote uh, to support this uh, very, very difficult uh, legislation. I'll, I'll keep, it, uh, keep it brief, but I, I did want to say one more thing, right? That, that the political pressure that Councilmember Arias uh, alluded to certainly is not, uh, not an easy thing to, to withstand against. Um, but I, I think we have this new council um, we've had for the last almost two years um, that is, is willing to have a, a steel spine, right, and, and standing up to some of these special interests and doing the right thing for our community. And ultimately, at the end of the day, this legislation is going to be a good thing for the entire city of Fresno. Uh, the, this council, I mean, supports grocery stores, we will bend over backwards in order to get more grocery stores, especially in our communities that are, are currently food deserts. And so I want to put that on the record, and I think some of the amendments that were made here earlier uh, uh, capture that sentiment. Uh, Councilmember Chavez, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you. I think my colleagues uh, captured the intent of, of this ordinance, and I want to thank all the stakeholders, the business owners that um, we met with um, from small to large uh, operators and really trying to understand this. But the main folks that I want to actually send a extra special thank you are, are the kids, uh, the youth that really led this effort. Um, it started off with a conversation about why they had to go through neighborhoods and, you know, unfortunately um, try to hop or, or skip over, you know, uh, urine or folks that were um, sleeping on the sidewalk that had been drinking outside of a uh, convenience store. And, and, and those are really the, the kids that, that led this effort, that worked with us, that did their due diligence and actually put in the work and the time to survey their colleagues and work within our schools and really gain the input that led what this policy looks like. Um, and, and I think this is a time for Fresno that you know, we're sending a message that we don't want more liquor stores that just bring blight and problems to neighborhoods that don't create value in our community. But we're also saying that what we do want, we want neighborhood markets that have fresh fruits and vegetables, that have amenities that you usually find in other parts of, of town and other parts of, of the state. And so what I want to make sure that, you know, folks understand, because I have a couple of those uh, markets that want to come into um, South Fresno to Southeast to the Blackstone corridor to, um, you know, Shaw Avenue and, and Kings Canyon is I want to make sure that they understand that the city welcomes you. We want you to provide fresh fruits and vegetables and organic options for our community. What we don't want, we don't want that operator that sells mall liquor for 99 cents uh, and ends up having, you know, adding blight to our neighborhoods. Um, and, and I also want to take this opportunity to put on notice 
those bad operators, uh, I've been keeping a list in my district of about, you know, five or six of them. The city of Fresno is not going to tolerate that anymore. And along with this new page that we're turning, we're also going to include a enforcement component of this. So long gone are those days when you were allowed to sell these types of, you know, liquor that, as my colleague referenced, are actually cheaper than water now. Um, and, and creating problems in neighborhoods. Um, and, and this will be an opportunity for those operators to clean up their act, um, or they will not be allowed to sell these types of products in our city. And I wanna make sure that folks understand, because I wanna be able to give that discretion and that power back to the community. Um, I, I also wanna, along with the text amendment, and I think my colleague codify that, is have a variance to where any project that wants to come to the city council and will actually provide a true neighborhood market will be allowed to, to set up shop in our community. We want that, we welcome that. And so I wanna make sure that folks understand that we have a variance uh, included in that uh, provision that we will be discussing uh, next week to ensure that we have a mechanism. And what I intend to do is first of all, um, that proposal will come to obviously the, the council member. What I'm going to do and Council members are free to, to do um, the process as they desire. I will be running that through my residents, through the implementation committee and getting their input and, and, and advice and really allow them to have that power back into the community where they can say, yes, this actually works for our community. We want this, or we want more shelf space for you know fresh fruits and vegetables or uh, meats, mm -hmm. cheese, deli uh, products, uh, baked goods. Um, we have a number of panaderias and carnicerias in South Fresno that I think would be a great fit for our community. And so we want to create that space uh, for them to be able to provide all these services. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, the folks understand that we have that uh, variance uh, where they can bring it forward. Um, it will be considered on, on their merits. But again, we want to make sure that our community is engaged and that neighborhoods are okay with what goes into their area because taking on this task of allowing uh, beer and wine in our community is no easy task. I think in the past, it was more of a hands-off approach and we see what that's caused in our community. And at the end of the day, we're trying to make every community a little bit better. We're trying to make it cleaner. We're trying to make it safer and we're trying to make it healthier. Um, and creating those options for our community is what really the intent of this is all about. And I think we're gonna get there. Um, it's gonna require uh, a little bit more work um, in the months and, and, and you know weeks to come. But I think we've got a good framework to allow that uh, to happen. And so with that, um, I'll turn it back to uh, the president. But before we do that, city attorney, we wanna make sure that um, we have that variance clause within the uh, text amendment that we're gonna be discussing, correct? Good morning, Council Member Chavez, Rena Gonzalez, Deputy City Attorney. I've been helping with um, shepherding the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act through. So for the variance that you speak of, it would need to be carried forward in a new resolution of initiation because it, because it is not currently included in the proposed text amendment. We have- That's correct. Right. So it would actually come in the form of an exemption um, mm -hmm. because a variance is a specific process in that um, would provide to probably a little bit more confusion than we need to sure. the process. So I just wanted to clarify that it would be coming back in a resolution of initiation Correct. as an exemption. Yep. Okay, great. Just want to make sure we get that uh, on the record and that folks understand. Um, I've got a couple of, um, you know, grocery stores that want to come into um, uh, South Fresno and I want to make sure they understand that those types of, of stores are welcome in our community. Thank you, Council Member Chavez. And I do want to, before I turn over back to the dais, um, thank Rena and Talia who have been on this for 22 months now, from day one to eight hour meetings to evenings and weekends and nights. So thank you both for being our um, legal and intellect in this process. Um, Council, if you would allow me, I'd like to turn over to the mayor and then come back with council comments. And then we'll go to the, um, you know what? Good point. Let me go to public comment first, since we have quite a bit of people here in attendance. So I will start with the folks who are here in person. So if you would like to address this item, please come forward and state your name for the record. And just note that after every single speaker, we will be sanitizing 
and switching off the filter on the mic. So just give us a couple of seconds in between speakers. But the first one um, who would like to come up, you're welcome to come forward to the mic. After the speakers who are here physically present, we will go to the virtual speakers who are um, here to speak on, on this item. And just do us a favor and identify yourself for the record. Uh, Debbie Darden, Southwest uh, resident, born and raised and still reside. Um, I'd like to say to you all, thank you for uh, bringing up the subject. It's been a long time coming. Um, I am standing in, in uh, support of the ordinance that you are presenting. Um, I really want people to understand because sometimes people who want to come and develop in your area, um, they have a tendency to give us a different definition in regards to what's coming in our area. And for those of you who have seen the movie um, Boys in the Hood, Lawrence Fishburne stated it best when he said, he asked a question, why do you think they put liquor stores in communities like West Fresno on every corner? It is so that we can kill ourselves. And that is the truth. In West Fresno alone, 93706, just a couple of years ago, I counted 22 liquor stores. There has been since others that have uh, opened up just in 93706, which is totally ridiculous. That's more liquor stores than any other community in the city of Fresno. And this has to stop. You keep talking about doing right by the wrongs that have been done. This is another example where it needs to stop. We have many um, small convenience stores. We just had a Fresno Mart opened up. All of these are within less than a mile radius of dollar stores. If you keep plaguing our community with dollar stores, we can't get the big box stores. Those big box stores bring jobs. People in our community are looking for jobs. All these little convenience stores, these little liquor stores, they're hiring within their own families. Their families don't live in West Fresno. Some of them live across town. Some of them are traveling from out of town. Many of our apartment complexes, they are owned by people who live out of the city of Fresno. So we need to stop continuing to plague the, the uh, things that we don't need and start giving us growth. Right now, we have a middle school that took over 30 years to get back. We have a junior college, a $87 million project that's coming in our area. It's time to start bringing state-of-the-art things that will bring these jobs, that will bring education to our community and start turning West Fresno around to what it used to be, a vibrant community. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody at, may ask the public speakers, once you speak, if you can exit the chamber so we can make room for new uh, members of the public. Um, Thank you for your patience as we work through this uh, whole new process of keeping things distant and sanitized for everyone's safety. Yeah. Good point. So now we're going to go to somebody. Uh, we're going to switch it around. We're going to go one public, one online to see if we can get movement much faster. So we'll do that after this next public speaker in person. Come forward, please. Good morning. I would like to applaud everybody that has worked uh, so tediously in this 22 months. My name is Rocio Madrigal. Um, I come from a small community called Mendota, from which Mr. Miguel Arias is very familiar. Um, and it is hard to do the right thing. I made a few notes, and you said it's to do the difficult thing. Um, we work, I work with Central California Environmental Justice Network. We work with a few thousand families in four counties. Um, they have gone through tremendous adversity during this COVID and still are. And so I applaud your efforts in trying to reach to those families. I'm here on behalf of those families. They would like to thank you uh, for this, what you're trying to do. Uh, some of them do not drive. Some of them do not have a second vehicle. Some of them have teenagers that they would like to send to the store for something like cilantro. And when you have, as the lady said, five, ten liquor stores in walking distance, but not one real, quote, real grocery store, it makes it very difficult. So, again, we work with a few thousand families that really, really need this to happen. And on behalf of all them, I ask you to please continue pushing forward. And thank you because they do not have the resources to drive across town like some of us do to Costco or Winco or anywhere else. And I do want to ask um, Councilmember Esparza, 
you said you would bend over backwards, and I just ask you to listen to your constituents. Our job in environmental justice is clean up water, clean air, take the pesticides away. When we have a good intention, like Amazon, it's a great intention, but sometimes we don't take into account what it does to the people around that warehouse location and how we're killing them slowly, okay? Good intention is great, but there has to be consideration to the people that live around there. And it is not fair for some who are a little bit, for lack of a better word, ignorant, that just say, well, if they don't like it, move away. They can't. Council Member Arias, you know, the people in Mendota that survive and have to live with the effects of pesticides cannot just pick up and move. That's not a reality for them. And I thank you for your time, and I thank you for your efforts. Thank you for coming today. The next person will go online while we sanitize is Estela Ortega. You are being unmuted. Sí, buenos días. Buenos días. Sí, buenos días. Mi nombre es Estela Ortega y soy residente de aquí de Fresno y soy del Distrito 7 y este, estoy apoyando para que no este, haya más licorerías. Hay en lugares donde hay dos licorerías y un lugar donde venden cigarros, entonces es demasiado para tener tantas cosas o tantas licorerías al mismo lugar. Cuando están a veces cerca de las escuelas o zonas de residencia, este, para, o, se, o zonas de parques también. Este, a veces hay lugares donde no tenemos donde vendan verduras o frutas. Necesitamos lugares como esos o zonas de recreación donde nuestros niños puedan hacer este ejercicio o también este lavandería. Hay, hay, yo pienso que Hay que quitar, que sean menos, que no haya licorerías, para que así disminuyan también los accidentes que hay, en, pues accidentes que hay por culpa de las personas que beben. O también hay muchas este, personas que también este, mueren a causa del cigarro también, igual. Entonces a mí me preocupa esto porque también mis hijos, tengo hijos y no me gustaría que ellos también estén cerca de estos lugares y menos Tampoco que estas, estas, estos lugares estén cerca de las escuelas. Muchas gracias. Gracias, señora Ortega. Come forward now, the public speaker in person. Good morning, uh, Mayor and the members of the council. I know it's been a while. It's great to see you all. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you for listening to young people over the past few years. Uh, this has been something as a program manager for uh, the City of Fresno Youth Commission as well as the Friday Night Live program. Young people have been, advocate, have been educating this council for the past eight years on the issue of liquor stores. Uh, so just, uh, just to share a few pieces, I know that the uh, alcohol beverage control has a recommendation of one liquor store for every 2,500 residents. Currently, we're one, at, one liquor store for every 1,000 residents in the City of Fresno. Uh, every year within the Friday Night Life program, student insight surveys are conducted within Fresno Unified and in Fresno County. And out of 1900, over 1,900 surveys from young people in Fresno, from uh, Fresno Unified schools, 54% said that it's fairly easy to very easy to access alcohol for young people. And so uh, I just want to uh, lastly say that when we do an activity with our young people called the Utopia Exercise, uh, young people have to design what their dream community looks like. And liquor stores have never, we have never heard liquor stores be part of that picture. It's always been green spaces. It's always been schools. It's always been healthy food markets um, in these communities. And so uh, today I just hope that uh, the council can be reminded that this, this is an issue that young people really care about. And if we're hearing about what the future looks like. This is the future and this is our current present and our young people really matter. And so definitely keep your young people in mind as you, as you hear today's topic. I thank you so much, council, and great seeing you all. And thank you on behalf of the city, thank all our youth and thank you and your organization for staying on top of this for so many years. With that, we'll go to Ivanka Sanders online while we disinfected the uh, podium. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Ivanka Saunders, and I'm a member of the District 3 Implementation Committee, and we supported this Responsible Neighborhood Market Act. For many years, community members, faith-based and nonprofit organizations, and finally, city officials, all see the need to eliminate one of the root causes that leads to the deterioration of a community, which is the oversaturation of liquor stores in disadvantaged neighborhoods of color. This act is an action to right the wrongs all the way back from the Reagan's era's war and infiltration on black and brown communities through the use of drugs and alcohol. This act is an action to correct the deliberate racist decision making of this city when the city historically turned its back on segregated communities of color by not investing in plans and policies that create a complete healthy thriving community. There are too many liquor stores, corner markets, and convenience store gas stations whose primary profit is due to the selling of alcohol instead of whole foods. This act allows for the opportunity to increase healthy stores in the middle of food deserts. Those that disagree with this act have had the privilege of living in communities where all of their essentials, essential needs are met, like a grocery store where the food doesn't have weevils in the non-perishables or spoiled milk. Maybe those that disagree with this act are realizing that their plans of continual profit off of the exploitation of disadvantaged communities of color is about to have limitations placed on where they conduct, conduct destructive business. If you have been so fortunate to live in a community that does not face the oversaturation of alcohol sales, then this act is a benefit to you as well in a preventative measure of, de of not devaluating, not devaluing your community. So thank you to all who put all the hard work and the hard conversations into this act. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Next present speaker, come forward, identify yourself and you'll have the floor. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us, appreciate it. My name is Rod Wade. I'm a part of Fresno United, an organization that's trying to help curb the gang violence in the streets, these shootings and all, all these senseless kill killings. We've had, in the last week, four or five females, you know, and a lot of that is because of these guys, these young gang members, or whatever you want to call them, on drugs, alcohol, they're already doing bad enough on their own. We don't need another source in our communities helping, help them doing what they're doing that's killing ourselves. The guy that just spoke up, I, I have some notes on his thing, too. But he touched on a lot of stuff that I was going to say, too, with the leadership group. One of California's largest cities, Fresno, has the highest concentration of alcohol licenses. Oversaturation is detrimental to the quality of life of neighborhoods, existing small business. Retail siding advertisements target disadvantaged communities and youth. Alcohol retail stores are an impediment to good land uses such as grocery stores. We need more stores. We don't need more alcohol. We don't need, we need grocery stores. We need small businesses that's gonna help give jobs to our community. We don't want no more liquor stores to help our youth help kill us. California, 25,000, 2,500 to one in California. Fresno, 1,001. South Fresno, 93706 where we live at, 500 to one. Fresno is 1,001, and we got 500,000 people, and South Fresno got over half of the stores. Come on, man. It, it, it's like they setting us up. They targeting us. Do They want us to kill us. You know, we don't, who would want to do that? What's the reason for doing it? What my God just spoke on, youth and neighborhood advocates. The Youth Leadership Institute's Friday Night Live program. December 2015, City, City Council voted 7-0 on resolution to address the issue, but never moved forward. 2015, 2020 now. 2015, 2020, YLFNL Youth conducted a positive billboard campaign to address negative advertising. All this. It, it, it's not helping us, bro. We, we speaking on this, we talking. We, I know I'm speaking as us, as a community, us people, 
that's here for it. We are here to tell you we're tired of having funerals for our dead kids killed by gun violence. So we are out in the streets trying to stop the violence only to find out that while we trying to do that, y'all still trying to put more liquor stores in our community that's helping provoke some of the violence. People get drunk and do drunk stuff. We don't want that. We don't want that. Developers are trying to push for more liquor stores, gas stations, and convenience stores that are poisoning our kids and pushing their agenda for more alcohol. Alcohol is already cheaper than water in our community. How's that? Water more healthy. How I got to spend more money to get water to get healthier than I do to buy a can of beer to get booze to get drunk and do some harm. Fresno has more stores that sell booze than any other city in our state. What the? I'm going to say it. <laughs> I was going to say Thank you for the decorum. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. What is they trying to do? Kill us or what? We got enough. We got enough violence. The police don't have enough police officers over there. They saying they understaffed because they can't control the violence. It's only going to make more violence. We don't need it. I'm going to tell you this. We don't need it, we don't want it, and we're not going to let it be built in our side of town. We're not. Thank you. Thank you for addressing the council. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we'll go online to John Kinsley as we disinfect the podium. John, you're unmuted. I think he's still muted. Yes. Uh, th oh, there you go. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you, members of the council um, and uh, President Arias. Um, my name is John Kinsey with Wanger Jones Helsley, and um, I've submitted correspondence to the city, and uh, we're basically requesting uh, just a short amount of time to help better fulfill the council's objectives um, in connection with this text amendment. Uh, these are objectives that we share. My clients are not detractors. Um, we agree uh, that the city really needs to discourage the bad actors and uh, these liquor stores that have, um, you know, ultimately been commented on today. And we believe that it is important for the city to promote more walkable grocery uses, especially in the era of uh, COVID. Uh, now, we're concerned about unintended consequences, and we don't want this council's decision to have the opposite effect of its objectives. And the concern here is that the text amendment will erect barriers to the development of new responsible walkable neighborhood markets uh, that are vital to our communities. And um, in the meanwhile, we're concerned that this text amendment will ultimately concentrate licenses uh, with existing users in existing areas. And we want to work with the city to help prevent that. Uh, for these reasons, we also don't think the city can rely upon the common sense exemption. CEQA ultimately is intended to prevent unintended consequences. And really further study of this is required because we don't want those unintended consequences to occur. Um, the common sense exemption only applies where it can be seen with certainty that there's no possibility that the action will have a significant effect on the environment. Here, by erecting uh, barriers to the development of neighborhood markets, walkable neighborhood markets, and clustering licenses in existing locations, and ch that will ultimately change and stifle traffic patterns in the city, making the city less walkable. Thank you, John. And preventing walkable access to grocery John. stores. This is exactly. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you conclude your comments, John? I don't want to cut you off. No, I think he can unmute himself. John, I didn't mean to um, have you stop talking. I just wanted you to close, conclude your comments. You just have to unmute yourself, John. I'm sorry, thank you. There you are. And with that, we just hope that the council will consider postponing this action to resolve this important issue. Thank you. John, for thank the record, you. who do you represent? Um, I represent Granville Holmes. Thank you. Next person, come forward, please. Good morning, good morning. Thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Sean Robinson. Um, I'm a resident of District 3. I've been here all my life. Um, all I want to say is that we all know that there's liquor stores everywhere. 
that's no puzzle. We already know about the licenses being exceeded. We already know that. But what we need to remember is that those liquor stores have people outside drinking liquor at, at every, at every, wherever you look, they drinking liquor. They stand there, they ask for change just to go in there and drink liquor. So our youth is seeing that when they go in there and buy chips, they go in there and buy candy or whatever. Um, West Fresno has, in 30 years, I've only seen a few things added to West Fresno. We have one grocery store, we have a great school, which is Gaston, and now we have the site for the college or whatever is going to be over there. I just say as a resident, we need something in West Fresno, and it's not a liquor store. Whoever's building liquor stores, hey, build them somewhere else, not in West Fresno. West Fresno is in a epidemic right now. We, it's, it's, COVID is not it. We are killing each other over there, period. And that's where it starts. It's easy for any of our youth to get liquor. All they have to do is pay somebody to go get it. And that's everywhere. I'm just leaning on the district three that, that where I come from, please do not let them build other liquor stores here. We, we need to rebuild our parks. In my neighborhood, I have a street out there since I was in the second grade. It hasn't even been fixed. That's, that's over by uh, West Fresno Elementary. That street has been like that since I was in the second grade. We need to fix stuff like that. I'm depending on this council. You, I trust you. I know we'll do the right thing. All right, thanks for having me. Thank you. Next speaker will be on virtually. Uh, Marie, I think I mispronounced her name, but if you can unmute her, Brianna. If you can identify yourself, you're next up. Good morning, my name is Mary Veronica Castillo. Yes, please okay. proceed. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is Mary Barati, and on behalf of about 400 families in the District 6 who formed the Healthy Neighborhood Alliance to fight the very same issue that this ordinance is trying to resolve, we support you in your approval of the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act. Thank you so much for your recognition of many health and safety issues caused by the oversaturation of liquor stores and the impact that it has on our kids, families, health, as well as public safety resources. This ordinance will properly address limiting the new liquor licenses. We just have way too many liquor stores and unfortunately the problem has been ignored for way too long. And we are facing having the similar issue in Northeast Fresno, unfortunately. And these essential restrictions with enforcement of the existing regulations will significantly enhance our current neighborhoods as well as preventing newly developed communities such as Copper River from facing the very similar issue. We're facing in Copper River and Maple, um, behind me, we're facing potentially four, not one, not two, not four new liquor stores and gas stations. Why? One liquor store has requested to open, operate 24 seven, allowing developers to do what is the best option for their business at the cost of harming communities and risking the health and safety of our children is unacceptable and must stop. The health and safety of our families and communities should be the priority for policy making. Fresno neighborhoods should be built with parks, libraries, and educational centers, not liquor stores in every corner. I want to thank the, uh, council members, Arias, Chavez, and Esperanza for your leadership and the team involved for their hard work and great job they have done for this well-balanced and um, needed updates. We are um, very actually really we were um, that when we heard council member Britta Phil on the news to say that he is generally supportive of this law. Thank you for your support, council member. And in conclusion, I want to say that um, please stand with family, uh, families of Fresno, our children, and approve the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act as recommended. Thank you so much for your consideration and approval. Thank you. The next speaker in person, please come forward. Good morning, everybody. My name is Salam Mohammed, and I'm uh, with Fresno United. And first off, I, I would like to say that uh, in order, if, if you have to address a community with intelligence, if you want them to respond with intelligence. And I believe that we have a problem, you know, in Fresno and a lot of communities. And uh, in order to offset event or repetition of events, you got to you got to get to the root 
or the cause of, 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 of this and not just the condition itself. So I believe it's safe to say that alcohol is the cause of a lot of a destruction, period. So to add more destruction to what we already trying to clean up and to bring more of, of, of destruction to our community, we, want, we don't want nothing dealing with destruction to our people, self-destruction or anything with destruction to our community. If, if they're going to bring something to our communities, bring something where we can benefit and be prosperous. You know, and uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really not, uh, I don't know how you say it, used to like, like this type of stuff, but I do feel a type of way. When I feel a type of way, sometimes I tend to take things. So I'm just telling you how I feel. We don't want nothing negative brought to our community. If you bring something, bring stuff like what we do at Fresno United, we try and bring buildings and stuff where our kids can integrate with each other because I understand that it, with the community, especially with the gang community, it's easy for them to hate you know, the people they don't know. So we try to integrate them, integrate them like they did with slavery, bring them together and bring stuff like that to where they can work together, get to know each other and, and, and grow together. Don't bring that liquor stuff where it's going to divide us and conquer us. Thank you. Next person online, Bill, you've been unmuted. Bill, for now. Let's go to uh, Anthony. Anthony? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Council President and Council Members. My name is Anthony Yu, and it is my privilege to speak to you on behalf of the Copper River residents who support the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act. As you probably know, Copper River is generally a safe and peaceful place to live, and so it may come as a surprise that Copper Avenue has become a site of controversy. To give you some context, Copper Avenue is immediately bordered by residential neighborhoods to the south and to the north, both residential and vacant lots zoned for commercial development. The community has anticipated that this commercial space will be used for grocery stores, restaurants, and businesses commensurate with the area. Instead, Copper Avenue is facing the prospect of four liquor stores and three gas stations along a one-mile stretch. One of these developments has already been approved at the Copper and Bryant. Two others are proposed at Copper and Maple, where a Rite Aid already exists. We find this threatening, and not only for the myriad of obvious problems that come with liquor stores and gas stations, such as crime and pollution, but also there is a key question of community need. Does this community need four carryout stores along Copper Avenue? With one liquor store already approved and a riot aid that provides everything you would expect from a convenience store, including alcohol, the answer is obviously no. Over the past few weeks, we have heard several arguments in favor of these liquor stores. We have heard that the new setback distances specified by REMA are too strict. Well, one of the proposed developments is about 150 feet away from Copper Academy Preschool and 350 feet away from Rite Aid. So forget about REMA. Even by today's current standards, that is too close. We've heard a request to allow grandfathering so a current applicant can obtain a liquor license for one of the proposed stores. Well, according to our own Fresno Planning Department, the limit for liquor licenses in our census tract is three. The third and final permit was granted to the recently approved development of Copper and Fryant. And wouldn't you know, to the same applicant who is asking to be grandfathered so that he can obtain a fourth license, exceeding the number allowed. We've heard that one of the convenience stores is actually a small market or even a grocery store. We have heard that it is modeled to be a small version of Trader Joe's. Well, here's what we know about that store. It will sell cigarettes and hard liquor behind the counter, be open 24 hours a day, and is next to a gas station. In my 25 years of shopping at Trader Joe's, I have never been to one that looks even remotely like that. And lastly, we have heard that the proposed quote-unquote market is in line with the city's vision of creating a more walkable city. Well, if that's the case, then why is it being built with a gas station? It's obvious what's happening, right? This is a pattern of behavior that has nothing to do with community well-being or community need or even REMA. It's about money, plain and simple. But let's be clear, this is not about one individual developer or operator. It's not even about Copper River. This is about Fresno. What direction are we going? In? Do we want to clean up our act and protect our communities, our homes, our kids? Or do we want to continue to allow business to shape our neighborhoods regardless of community concern, regardless of the consequences? One liquor store for every thousand people. That is an embarrassing and quite frankly, scary statistic. We can do better. We are not anti-business. We are in fact quite the opposite. We support the creation of a thriving commercial district, and if any of the proposed developments were for an actual Trader Joe's, we'd be the first in line. We are pro-business, we are pro-capitalism, but first and foremost, we are pro-Fresno. 
During this process, I, I've had the pleasure of speaking with many of you. I've been upfront in telling you that I'm doing this to protect my two young daughters, but it's become so much more than that. This is for Molly Britton, a 23-year-old Fresno State nurse and graduate, killed by a drunk driver at the corner of Copper and Prime. This is for Ron Bakia, my neighbor, who while out for his daily stroll was killed by a drunk driver at the very same corner four years later to the day. You see, we are an affluent community, but we are not immune to the ills of alcohol-related crime. This is for my dad, who like so many others in this community, walks the same paths Ron Bhatia did walk every day. This is for my neighbor, Jim Fugman, who fears for the safety of the kids who attend his school, Fugman Elementary, which faces the prospect of being flanked by liquor stores and gas stations. This is for Jennifer Chi and all the runners and cyclists who use the paved trail along Copper, which can now be turned into driveways for liquor stores. And this is for the Youth Leadership Institute, our city's young leaders who have the courage to speak out for change. They are the future. They don't care about zoning requirements or conditional use permits, and they certainly don't care about a wealthy developer's bottom line. They care about building a safe community for everyone, for you, for me, for friends, for neighbors, for your family, my family, your kids, my kids, for our city. This is our chance. Please vote yes on the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, if you can come forward. years specifically uh, District 3 and uh, I, mean, I don't have to throw no numbers out there I just want to say that you know you, we don't need no liquor stores uh, in Southwest Fresno I mean we don't need no more liquor stores in Southwest Fresno I mean I don't know if you guys paying attention or listening you know but we don't need no more liquor stores in Southwest Fresno you know, we don't need no more liquor stores in Southwest Fresno so many other things, you know, Southwest Fresno need, you know, but there's no urgency to, to address those issues. So many other things, when I ride on other parts of town, you know, I see dog parks, parks for dogs, nice dog parks for dogs, for animals. But when you ride Southwest Fresno, you don't see that for our kids, for our kids. I see dog parks for dogs, for animals look better than our parts. That's on Southwest Fresno. Like that need to, that need to change. You know, that, that need to change. You know, y'all say y'all care about all people, but I, I can't tell. I can't tell. How do you care? I've been in Southwest Fresno for 20 years. I ain't seen no changes in 20 years. But you know, y'all come and speak and say, oh, we care about the community. No, you don't. That's a lie. And we tired of y'all lying to us. We don't need no liquor stores. What about some healthy food options? What about some outlets for these gang members? You know, like that's been an issue for years, but it's spreading around the city. Now y'all want to act like y'all care a little bit. Y'all don't care. Y'all just care because it's happening on other parts of town. It's been going on on the West. Enough is enough. We don't need no alcohol, no liquor stores in Southwest Fresno. Thank you. The next person, Shelton, online. You are unmuted. Shelton. Let's move on to Ed, Brianna. Ed, you are unmuted. You can address the council. Great. Thank you all. I'll make this brief. Um, I'm a retired law enforcement officer from the city of Fresno, and I was invited to this uh, to this meeting to kind of give an input from that perspective. And I have to agree with the council and, and the people, most of the people that have spoken on here. Nothing really good comes from liquor stores. Um, great example is there's a murder trial going on right now from an incident that took place at Chestnut and Clinton. Um, and it was a basic misdemeanor juvenile delinquent was trying to engage uh, another man to buy alcohol for him and he refused the incident took place so i think this is a really important ordinance i think that the council should vote yes on it because um and, and another thing too i don't know if you guys can consider this but limiting the hours of operation on these establishments because when you're open past 10 o'clock nothing ever good is going to come out of it um 
So I think this is long overdue. I think it's not just in one area of town, it's, it's all over Fresno. And I think it's a shame what's going on that they guys liquor stores using convenience stores to guise the um, liquor stores because the real profit is in the liquor, not in the cheap products that they're selling around it. So I agree we need the need grocery stores that provide fresh fruits, vegetables, everything, but it's also going to cut down on crime. It's going to make these neighborhoods better. Uh, it's going to help with blight. So I, I think you're on the right course and I, I just want to uh, give you my support for that. Thank you. Next public speaker in person. Come forward, please. Good morning, Council. My name is Kimberly McCoy, Project Director for Fresno Building Healthy Communities. Um, I just want to let you guys know that I stand in support of the, of the ordinance. Um, I am a mother to an eight-year-old boy. Um, I grew up in West Fresno. West Fresno made me who I am. That's why I'm in here today addressing you. Um, even though I don't reside in West Fresno, I still live in South Fresno. I live in District 1, Esmeralda Soria's district. Um, as a mother of an eight-year-old boy, me and my husband, we have to worry about a lot of things. We have to teach him how to maneuver in this world as a black man. We have to teach him how to act when his mother or father is pulled over by the police department. We have to teach him a lot of things. We can't teach him his multiplications, his divisions, his subtractions, his sight words, and things like that because we're so busy teaching him other things because of what's going on in the world right now. Um, in District 1, there has been two shootings. Not only now do we have to worry about our young black men, we have to worry about our young black women now. They're getting killed. And, you know, we haven't heard anything from the police department. We haven't heard a press conference. We haven't heard anything from our mayor or our mayor-elect on those issues. So having these liquor stores in these neighborhoods, they only, they're an eyesore. People hang out. They're a gathering for gang activity. Just a couple of weeks ago on Ashland and Marks, my son goes into the um, barbershop to get his hair cut over there. There was a shootout at that liquor store. There, that owner does not tell people not to stand out in front of his liquor store. He lets them gather, he lets them do whatever he wants, wants them, they want to do because they are spending money, they are buying beer, they are buying black and mouths, they are buying cigars, they are putting money into his store. This is ridiculous. We need more investment. I have worked and I have canvassed West Fresno for many years trying to get people involved, trying to get them involved in the Southwest Plan, trying to get them involved in the TCC, trying to get them involved in issues that affect their communities. Even though we're seeing the campus being built, even though we have a junior high school, even though we're seeing community um, farms, um, um, I'm sorry, farmers markets being built and we're seeing people take ownership of things and getting involved. Those are piecemeal approaches to the real problem. You know, we need grocery stores here, not just the food max that's here that the prices are sky high and their fruit and vegetables look ridiculous, look rotten. We don't need that. We need, you know, in Nelson Esparza's district, he has a neighborhood Walmart. That's not big like a supermarket Walmart. That's a small little neighborhood store that offers fresh fruits and vegetables and other necessities that we need. That's something that can go into West Fresno. That could be the start of attracting big businesses into West Fresno that our community needs. You cannot say that our community doesn't care because look at this room. Look at all the people that spoke. We care. We just need you to care. We come here time and time again asking you guys for something that's common sense that we need in order for us to be productive. And it's time for you guys to stand up and do the right thing. I support you, but I want to see more. Thank you. Thank you. Next person online. Can you unmute them? and have them self-identify. You're online and you can address the council. Doctor? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Hi, good morning council members. Um, uh, lived in, uh, I live in district uh, six and I wanna make my comments quick as a lot of people has commented. I don't, I'm not gonna go through the statistics. I just wanna bring your attention to the public health issue that alcohol and drugs brings to the community. Um, as a physician, I see the other end of it. Uh, the photo that you shared um, a little bit ago showed a kid holding a sign saying alcohol is a drug. Alcohol is a drug, the only difference is alcohol is legal. As a physician, I'm on the other receiving end of seeing the effect of alcohol and drugs that brings to the children and the adults tearing their family apart. 
I'm hoping that the council members have the courage to pass this bill. Uh, this is to protect our neighbor, neighborhood and children. This is not about a specific district or zone. This is about city of Fresno. Thank you. Thank you. Next person in person, come forward, please. You want to pull the mic down so that oh. we can hear you? I just didn't know if I can touch it. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> so um, my name is Hilda Osuna Perez. Pull I it a little more down. There you go. My name is Hilda Osuna Perez. I am the program coordinator for the Friday Night Live program at the Youth Leadership Institute. And I'm here to speak to you guys uh, on behalf of my youth who are right now, obviously, at school. Um, you know, online, so they were not able to attend. However, I do have a recorded message from one of our youth from the Roosevelt Friday Night Live chapter. So I would just like to share that with you. Nicole My address is 4592 East Bird Avenue, Fresno, California, 93725. I am 17 years old and an alumni of the Roosevelt Friday Night Live chapter. Lily Vane, Christina Garcia, and I advocated for RNMO last year, and City Council passed this act. We are the ones that see in our day-to-day -day lives that our communities were and still is oversaturated with liquor stores. My school that I had gone to before the pandemic had over 20 liquor stores within a one mile radius. And this policy is to make our communities safer and healthier. But South Fresno has been systematically oppressed by those who do not live in our communities, telling us how our community should be shaped. What we want and ask for is having community gardens, safe walking paths to school, clean parks, and access to parks. We never think of outside businesses and developers coming in and forcing their way into our communities. Is this as for how? And this policy is to make our communities safer and healthier. But South Fresno has been systematically oppressed by those who do not live in our communities, telling us how our community should be shaped. What we want and ask for is having community gardens, safe walking paths to school, clean parks, and access to parks. We never think of outside businesses and developers coming in and forcing their way into our communities. Is this as for having healthy and safe communities too much to ask for? because it is not, and it shouldn't, as it is our basic human right to live in a community that is not oversaturated with liquor stores. I want to remind all council members that back on May 1st, 2019, at 3.25 p.m., you all voted yes on RNMO to be passed. So I ask you to vote yes on RNMO. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for allowing that young person to speak uh, virtually again. Now we'll go to the next person online. You have been unmuted. Please address the council. Praveen. Hi, can you hear me? Now we can. Proceed, please. Hi, my name is Dr. Badiga, and I'm a family allergy uh, asthma expert here. And I have, uh, I'm board certified in allergy immunology and a physician living in District 6. I appreciate the Fresno City Council entertaining to hear your city residents and responsible about the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act and voice on how to plan the future for the neighborhood that we reside in. I'm really dismayed uh, that even though I have appeared and testified on behalf of Fresno County to the EPA, the Environmental Pre Protection Agency, as a health spokesman for the uh, American Lung Association, many times during this decade, over 10 years, to voice my objection to escalating air pollution, declining air quality in Fresno at the Fresno City Hall is what, where I testified, and that I would one day have to testify to my council members and their representatives on the dangers of air pollution liquor-related accidents and deaths and the sudden eruption of permit requests. 
for gas stations and liquor licenses on Copper Avenue. Uh, we need to understand that it's a home to a lot of educational institutions, um, such as Copper River Academy Preschool, Fugman Elementary, Clovis North Educational Complex, and hundreds of students walk, bike, drive along Copper Avenue to and from these schools on a daily basis. These gas stations with attached grocery or convenience stores are actually cloaked as liquor stores. It's like a Trojan horse. And they started open as a liquor store uh, disguised. Um, and regardless of the business hours, um, we already have one such outlet at Copper and Friant that's been approved by uh, the planning division. And also we have um, that sells liquor actually at Pro Copper and Friant. The same actual place very nearby where one of my friends dear father died when he was crossing the road by hit by a drunk driver almost a year ago. And there have been multiple DUI accidents at the, at the damaged property, bodily injury, and all over that area and, and all over Fresno. We know the facts that Fresno has been labeled as a very high DUI rate city in the country, actually in the top 25, if not five. The last time I looked, it was five out of 25. And uh, I've supported, I've uh, sent to you uh, supportive um, citations for this. Um, and this is directly respond, uh, uh, proportional to the liquor store availability and attributed adverse alcoholic behavioral effects leading to DUI fatalities, domestic violence, and other crimes seen all over Fresno City. We are also ranked in the top five cities for air quality Due to, to, uh, due to where we are because of the inversion layer, the vehicular diesel emissions. We are the central go-through pass for nor Northern California, Southern California through Interstate 5, as well as the 99 with such a high load of diesel trucks. The Thank Fresno you, Doctor. City now considering a new law that will protect us, our neighborhood and all the others from proliferation of liquor stores. And I appreciate them for realizing this before it's too late to fix. Thank you, I doctor. strongly support the agenda item and uh, for the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act. Thank, Thank you, you, doctor. Next person in person, come forward. Yes, my name is Shanta Smallwood, executive member with the Fresno United. I'm gonna let Salam Mohammed have my time. Of course, you may proceed. To say something real quick that I forgot to say. Um, I believe that uh, people or persons are a product of their environment, and uh, or they become a product of their environment. And I believe that uh, our environment in West Fresno need, is in <laughs> desperate need of damn near 100% uh, restoration. And uh, I also believe that I, I was, I, be, I was, be, I think it would be safe to say that all of you guys probably have an addict in your family, whether it's a uh, dope crystal, whatever, some type of addict. And I believe that uh, these young gang members that's out here doing stuff lost and unconsciously, and some people might feel that they're doing it consciously, I believe they are addicts. They're addicted to their lifestyle. And we need to reform them. Now, I was at a, at a town hall meeting, and I heard an officer say that they was bringing in the feds to pick up all the gun charges for the youngsters. And, uh, but he failed to say that, well, this, this is what he was saying. And to me, I thought that they don't want to deal with a problem because, you know, you have to get to the root. You, he, he never once did he mention that they want to go after the manufacturers or the ones that's giving them or uh, allowing the accessibility, the uh, access of these guns. They just want to deal with the condition of the people that's in, that the guns got here. So I say they don't want to fix a problem because you have to deal with the, with, the, with the court. So what I'm saying is instead of taking all these youngsters and removing them, Give us opportunity to reform them. That money that they want to instantaneously go spend to bring the feds in to remove these people. And we all know how much it costs to prosecute one individual. But just the portion of that money, give it to the community that we know how to deal with our people. The, the, the way that they've been dealing with them for years ain't working. But we know how to deal with them. Let us deal with it in this way and reform them. Uh, 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 what do you call Recultivate them. We just need a little help from y'all, a little support. Don't spend all that money on throwing them away because when you throw them away, you got a fatherless kid, you got a, a, uncle, a nephew that's uh, uncleless. You, it's taken away from the community, so just by throwing them away is not fixing the problem. You know, so let's address the problem and get to the problem and 
Thank you. Some of this time and effort, that same energy that they want to throw us away, and it's reforming, it's helping us reform them. That's it. Thank you. Next person is Christine on virtually. Hello. I am Kristen Sapien, and I live in the Copper River area with my husband and five year old child. I am speaking today as a thankful parent and resident of Fresno that we have a city council who wants to improve our city. I urge all of you to vote today to pass the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act as it is. Over the years, the issue of alcohol has been huge in my family, so I know firsthand how devastating having this drug around can be in proliferation. My uncle has passed away at the age of 48 due to alcoholism, and my father has been in and out of rehab facilities. I remember growing up and learning about the Say No to Drugs campaign, very powerful. It is fitting that this next Monday, my son is having his very first Red Ribbon Week. Alcohol is a drug, and that is why we teach our kids starting them off so young in life to say no. So what are we seeing to our kids? Don't do drugs, yet we drive and walk our kids by these stores on the way to school with questions being raised. Seems very hypocritical, hypocritical, sorry. I do not want an overabundance and easy access to alcohol, and I feel that by having these stores that sell it lined up on a street, on every street corner, as in some parts of town, is just overkill and downright dangerous. I am hopeful that when I saw an ABC 30 news clip that our District 6 Council member, Gary Bradfield, said he generally supports the ordinance. I sure hope so, because hearing everyone's testimony today, it's absolutely breaking my heart about what is going on all over the city, not just in our district. I find it quite appalling that a Johnny Quick can even apply for an alcohol permit right now next door to an established preschool that my son went to. This is getting out of hand, and by passing this, I feel like it will make our city of Fresno a better quality place to live and raise our children in. This is about the future of all Fresno. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and for the general public, the next person can come forward in person. I will ask that you limit your comments to one minute. We have a couple of dozen more people who wish to address this item before we get to our regular agenda for them uh, today. So one minute for all public speakers, um, please. Thank you. My name is Aaron Foster. I live 23, uh, 2683 South Bordell, Fresno, California, 93706. In your district, this district, I don't want to be redundant and saturated, but I'll give you uh, a vision of how saturated it is. Wayne's Liquor Store on California. People, uh, we had three shootings last month. Across the street, directly across the street, we have the fruit stand. We had murders this year. Well, one of our um, mentors of Marcel killed. You go one street light south, that's east, excuse me. You have a historical landmark of people being killed. My son was killed in that parking lot, with, along with the list that's too long, at least 10 other murders. Go back to Wayne's. You go to the liquor store south, you have another landmark, historical murders. I can think of five people murdered. If you go one more street light, we just had a, a murder last month inside of the store. So liquor stores are attached to murders, and I'm an advocate of gun violence reduction. I believe if you add more liquor stores, you add more murders. Thank you. Next person online. Heron, Kaya Heron. Good morning. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council President. And thank you to all the folks in attendance. Uh, my name is Kaya Heron, and I am the Director of Community Engagement and Advocacy for the Fresno Metro Black Chamber of Commerce. And we applaud the Council for taking action and following the bold leadership of our youth on addressing the saturation of liquor licenses and blight in our city. We agree that our communities deserve better and thank you for prioritizing the health and safety of our neighborhoods. As an organization representing small black owned businesses and aspiring entrepreneurs, we would be remiss to not raise concerns about the potential unintended consequences of the ordinance. Specifically, that current license holders will potentially be given an unfair advantage and will be able to set the price for license purchases necessary to satisfy the ordinance requirements, ultimately pricing out those who want to build real grocery stores. Without explicit language in the ordinance, that prevents this from happening, we cannot support the ordinance today. We respectfully ask for a 30-day delay in taking action on the proposed ordinance to address this potential unintended consequence. We hope the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act will ultimately achieve its intended goals for the community's benefit. And we th thank you for putting our community's best interests first. 
stopping with continued excessive alcohol license grantors, and ending the, the public health crisis that alcohol and drugs bring Thank to you. Community. Next person in person, come forward, please. Yes, hello, my name is Lula Tucker, a resident. Uh, I'm also a retired substance abuse counselor. I deal with Mothers with Children's program, and basically a family, you know. Um, I would like to say, I, I kind of don't even know why this is even a topic about bringing liquor stores to, to any neighborhood, really, um, as, as it brings um, uh, a lot of damage, not only to the families, but to also to the, to the residents in the area. But what I want to leave with each and every one of you right now, that uh, families, damaged families, produce more damaged families. You know, and we're looking to you guys to be able to assist and help us. You're in a position. You look around, you see. But nine times out of ten, what I learned as a counselor is normally people who are in substance abuse grew up around someone who was in substance abuse also. Can we please break some chains and some cycles? And just briefly, you know, uh, even though um, just being in the neighborhoods and you do see violence at every drug or liquor store, why would we want to continue that? It seems like our police is and everyone is having a hard time also. But let's be proactive instead of reactive. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for those thoughtful words. Uh, next person online is Andy. Andy? Can you hear me? Yes, please. Hi, uh, Councilman. Uh, my name is Andy Chikara, President of American Petro and Canadian Store Association, over 1,600 members. I appreciate uh, Councilman Arya Chavez Nelson and other members who work over 18 months uh, to make this good uh, neighborhood association in the uh, early months. Uh, Unfortunately, I heard some comments, I do agree uh, to the comments. We looked at the issue of alcohol problem, our businesses are in on this issue. Andy, my apologies, we had to cut you off. We had too much feed and it couldn't uh, be heard. Uh, next person in person, if you can come forward. And Andy, thank you for the support and the months of work um, on this uh, project. And I'm sorry that the connection was so bad. You may proceed with addressing the council. My name is Terry Brent Shelton, Jr. I go by TJ. I live in Esmeralda's district. Um, I'm not pro bring any more liquor stores anywhere, personally. Uh, I hear people complaining about all different kinds of neighborhoods. When I grew up, Copper was a dirt road. Like, like it was, it was uh, uh, Fresno wasn't as sprawled as far north as it has been. And I understand they have concerns, but their concerns are light compared to but it's interesting hearing their research and and their perspective regarding how like in that area on copper one person has all four licenses looking to grandfather in one of the ones that they already possess to gain a fifth and more to exceed the current rules um how can we break that up like how can we get more community smaller people in control of these licensing uh, situations and not have them consolidated like that. Because, I mean, the real cry is community investment. The, uh, we, we don't want more liquor stores. Uh, personally, I would rather see alcohol have much more stringent regulation and cannabis have less. Um, and I would like to see the licenses for those go into the communities where they are hosted and not be part of a larger push of people with capital because that's, Thank you. I, I'm pro-capitalist, but we've got community issues to deal with. Thank you. Next person online, Seed. Saeed. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. All right, thank you. My name is Saeed Attar. Um, I'm a 22-year resident of Fresno in District 2. I'm a professor of chemistry at Fresno State. I'd like to thank the Fresno City Council for providing this opportunity for us to speak as residents. I especially want to commend uh, council members Chavez and Esperanza uh, for uh, leading this effort. Um, I'm a proud father of uh, two girls. I've, uh, I teach students in the 18 to 22 year range. And uh, I would like to bring the attention of the council to the effect of easily accessible alcohol 
on college students. That's something that hasn't been addressed, and I'd like to address that. And as a professor here for 22 years, and as someone as an educator for 25 plus years, I've seen the effects of easily available alcohol on, on, on our youth. This uh, week, as a matter of fact, October 10th, was uh, declared by the, uh, the, the, national, the World Mental Health Day, uh, October 10th, uh, and the National Alliance for Mental Illness has um, uh, said it many times that alcohol abuse can, uh, can cause or can heighten the signs and symptoms of depression, anxiety, and psychosis. And, and once in a while, I do see that firsthand in the students that I try to teach. So I'd like to bring your attention to that, and I hope that the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act uh, will, will be passed today. Thank you. And I appreciate your effort. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Say. Any other persons here in person who need to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we'll complete the virtual public comment. Victor Gonzalez, you're up next. Good morning, and thank you for your time today. My name is Victor Gonzalez, and I'm a resident of District 2 in the city of Fresno. I'd like to start by saying that the stated goal of reducing the oversaturation of liquor stores is a noble one. The presentation circulated by Mr. Arius, dated 924, states that the statistics that many have shared here today, so I won't repeat them, since I think we can all agree that there is an oversaturation of liquor stores in parts of Fresno, and no one is happy about that. With that being said, I oppose the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act as written today because it does not address the immediate problems found in today's areas with those high concentrations. This ordin the ordinance bans single servings of beer, malt liquor, wine coolers, and other single serve containers as other cities have concluded that banning single, servings, single serving containers would reduce crime. While I don't disagree with trying that approach, the same presentation I referenced earlier share states that existing businesses will experience no change to current operations, including single sale. So I'll repeat, no change to current operations, including single sale. So in closing, my ask is that we solve the problems of today by addressing the issues and businesses that exist today. We also need to be mindful of the impact the ordinance will have on businesses such as neighborhood markets. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Be... Oh. Thank you. I, just one more sentence, if I, if Please I can. Please proceed. Yes. Uh, in light of the variance discussed about earlier in the meeting, it seems that a delay in this vote would be prudent in order to provide members of the community an opportunity to review it and have it added to the ordinance after proper vetting. Thank, Thank you. you. Next one is Zhang. You are unmuted. You may address the council. Good morning, uh, Mayor, City Council members, and Fresno community members. My name is Valia Zhang, and I am a longtime Fresno resident now residing in District 1. I work for a lo local nonprofit organization, and I'm also a yoga uh, instructor, community yoga instructor. And I also want quickly uh, and acknowledge the city and the organization and youth who have worked on this act. It's a step towards healthy living for our community. Uh, also, as a Hmong American, I see firsthand the impact alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs have people. Just a week ago, a family friend was involved in a drunk uh, driving car accident that took her, her husband, and two small nieces to the hospital and in critical care. Uh, to paint the bigger picture here, is that by preventing alcohol, tobacco, and other drug access and use in the long run will reduce the healthcare costs, and that in return will increase resources for other needs in our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being brief and concise. Next one is Grecia, you're unmuted. Good morning, uh, council president, council members. My name is Grecia Lenes. Um, I work for Leadership Council, uh, Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, and I'm also a lifelong resident of the city of Fresno. Um, after years of working in my own backyard, the issues of, of liquor stores and their prol proliferation, um, them selling to underage kids, permitting the, pan the pandering in their own property when people buy alcohol has come up time and time and time again. Um, I myself grew up within uh, the radius of three liquor stores, all within three blocks. Um, and it was just incredible to, to me now thinking back how easy it was for me to just uh, access um, tobacco, cigarettes, um, alcohol, so much easier than, than healthy foods or even a park for, for that instance. Um, you know, I, I, this, this Neighborhood Market Act, I wish it, it would do something to address the issues today, but unfortunately this is a, more of a long-term uh, measure that I, I, I can see really benefiting the communities, especially those in, in South Fresno. And as such, 
I urge this council today to adopt this, do not delay, adopt this today, and hopefully, you know, come back and improve this, this ordinance to be able to address the issues that we see today, because we cannot wait any more longer. This is way past overdue, and thank you, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Next person is Lisa Flores. You have a minute to address the council. Um, good morning. I stand in support of this motion. Um, like a gentleman said earlier, uh, we need no more liquor stores, but what you do need is funding. You need funding in this community for um, changes to the general plan. You need funding for your environmental justice element. You need funding for more parks. You need funding for cleaning up toxic um, sites and parks. You need more health care services. You need more union jobs and grocery stores. Um, you need more funding. Uh, also, too, you need more funding for your truck study, but I'll call you about that later. But um, in general, I stand in support of this. Thank you. Thank you. Next person. Uh, uh, ahead hello? Let me, let me think. Yes, please identify yes. yourself. Hi. Hello, hi, my name is Dr. Virgin Mirzayan. I'm a resident of Fresno. Um, I, uh, first of all, wanna thank this opportunity and Fresno Council for all your work. Uh, I am for the RNMA. And I just wanna say one thing that what sets us, sets us apart as humans compared to other creatures is that we have the ability uh, to have future intelligence, which means that we can predict our future, make a decision and change the present and therefore altering our future. This is an amazing power. And today this power is, is in the Fresno Council. You have the power to change the direction and the course that we are on. Uh, the, you know, the, um, if you look at what definition of stupidity is, it's, the, it's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. We see from uh, the course that we're on, we are not on a, on a proper path. We need to change and change today, not tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. We, can, we have to save every single child's future. By uh, having more, market, more, more liquor stores come in, you're not going to increase the revenue uh, from taxes for Fresno because you can only buy so much. You know, you cannot just basically increase the, the market, you know. So you, if you think by saying yes uh, to more liquor stores, you're gonna increase the revenue for Fresno, that is a false perception. So I commend every council member that is going to vote for this today um, and pass it. Because if you say no, basically you are saying that you are for alcoholism and you are for drug abuse and you are for the negative direction for Fresno. So I would highly recommend that you think about your actions and use your power very wisely because you were chosen by the people to represent the people and I appreciate this time. Thank you, doctor. Next person is Jesus Mendoza. Yes, uh, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, more than anything, I want to say that this is long past due. This is not that it's been recent. As a matter of fact, high school students within uh, Fresno Unified School District had identified this problem. Just thinking about Roosevelt High School, where I worked and uh, worked with the leadership groups there, Dare to Dream and uh, high school leadership, students had identified that they were uh, within the mile, mile radius of Roosevelt. Uh, there were about 26, 27 uh, liquor stores that they'd come across. So every student, uh, most of the students who walk to campus, they would bump into one or two liquor stores on their way home. So this is, uh, it's quite past due. So it's not something that I'm happy about right now. I'm actually urging for the city council to be responsible and take leadership, not to continue to criminalize us immigrant communities as the ex-police chief used to do with us with their, his DUI point. So if we are really about values, this is the time to take action. We're, uh, we're the drunkest city in California, think about it. This speaks volumes of our leadership, that is your, your leadership. So let's take responsibility and move forward. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Next person is Becky. Becky, can you hear us? Actually, I think, uh, uh, Council President, can you hear me? Yes. 
uh, unfortunately, uh, Becky, my, my assistant, set this up, and uh, it's really, um, I raised my hand, but her, her name shows up. No worries. Uh, uh, for the record, it's not Becky. It is uh, Darius Asimi. Exactly. Of Thank Grand you, City Home. Clerk. Yes, of Granville Home, City Clerk. You may proceed. Uh, thank you. Uh, I also despise liquor stores and what they have done to our community, especially Southwest Fresno. Um, my challenge, and I've shared this with council over this act, it, it does not remove liquor stores in Southwest. And it continues to allow single sale of alcohol, which is another issue that, that, I've, had, that, I've, that, I've, that I've communicated this, with council. What we do need in Fresno, as many folks have spoken this morning, is we need more grocery stores, we need more neighborhood markets. And the way it's written, and my understanding of, of, of what the way it's written, is that it prohibits small neighborhood markets under 10,000 square feet uh, to open. It puts barriers against those. Um, I, again, I, um, I want to say vehemently, I despise what liquor stores and single sale alcohol has done to our city, to our community, especially Southwest Fresno. You, you want more liquor stores? We've got to amend this act. And, I, and I'm encouraged by Council, uh, council Member uh, uh, Chavez uh, amendments that would allow, and I hope, Council President, you will, you will take those on and the rest of the council to make amendments to allow the small grocery stores to open up all over our community that are walkable and, and, and in congruence with the general plan's uh, mission and, and your vision. Um, uh, again, I, we hope to work together. Again, I can't emphasize enough. I despise what liquor stores and drunk driving has done to our youth, to our school systems, to our the people that have to walk across liquor stores. Thank you, Mr. Asimi. Thank you. Thank you. Next person is Suki. I hope I pronounced that correctly. You're unmuted. Hi, my name is Suki Sahoda. I'm a nurse who lives in the Copper River neighborhood. Uh, I lost a fellow colleague, a nurse that was killed in a drunk driving accident on Copper and Friant a few years ago. I have two teenage boys who, go, uh, who attend Copper, sorry, Clovis North High School. I also have a nine-year-old who attends the Fugman Elementary School District, just steps away from their proposed two gas stations, liquor stores in our area. We moved to this area 10 years ago to raise our kids in a safe neighborhood bringing in liquor stores and gas stations to this friendly area would just add violence and crime to our family-friendly neighborhood. Please rethink allowing this to happen. We are California, uh, in California, Fresno is already negatively viewed as the armpit of California. Let's not do any more damage to our already tarnished community. We, we don't need added traffic in our, um, in our area. Copper already has too many cars racing down the streets Adding gas stations and liquor stores will just add to that problem. Let's all do better by keeping our community safe. Thank you. Thank you, Suki. And the next person is Nick. Please proceed. You'll have a minute to address the council. Nick, can you hear us? All right, let's move on to yep. Roy. Yep. Oh, can there you, hear you me are. Now? We almost missed you. Go ahead. Good morning, Council President and members of the Council. My name is Nick Urbino, Jr. And I'm looking for clarity on how this ordinance will affect those who currently have applications uh, being processed by the city. Thank Nick, you. Nick, thank you. This is your opportunity to address the Council. Uh, is, that, is that all? Yep. Thank you. We will proceed with Raj. Please proceed, Raj. You are the last speaker on this item before we return to the dais. <laughs> Uh, respected Council President and members, my name is Raj Deep Singh. I live in Northwest Fresno. As listening to all the comments and concerns, I feel all store owners are painted as evil people. There are many store owners who came forward as city and police department needed help in the past. Please don't see all the store owners with one vision. There are many good operators in our town. I'm a small business owner and operator since 2005 in Fresno area. We have been working on a project for several years with the neighborhood market model where we offer fresh and healthy food with a quick serve restaurant. Alcohol sales are incidental and not consumed on site. Our design has less, less than 5% sto uh, uh, sales area for alcohol. We understand our responsibility as a store owner and operator. I agree with the council. We do not need any more liquor stores in our town. It does not matter what part of the town. We do not need any more liquor stores, but we do need neighborhood markets. These new amendments will put stop to Thank the you, neighborhood Raj. markets and will suffer huge financial damages. Thank you, Raj. I would request the council Thank you, not Raj. to... Council, um, that concludes the public comment virtually in person. I do want to 
just reference for the record that we received um, several petitions um, via email and electronic comments. Um, there's approximately 400 um, comments in Northeast Fresno, a couple hundred um, signatures of petitions for Northwest Fresno, in, a, in, a, in, a, in addition to several emails um, in support and in opposition. So I just wanna make sure for the record, we've received approximately 1,000 um, members who reached out to us via email or petition in support. And from my account, about uh, 25 in opposition to it. Just wanna make sure that's clarified for everyone. Mr. President, sure it's kind of funny that my residents are reaching out to you and not to me, because they Remember, call me, they have my cell phone number. Member, it's 601-0564. I'm my residents know how to reach out to me, sir. Council member, if you would not interrupt, it's just making sure it's clear for the record that we received everyone's comments. I'm not referencing to you in any way personally, so please let's keep the decorum. What does Northwest Fresno mean? I'm just curious. Council member, we will now return to the dais and uh, we'll turn the, the mic over to our mayor who's joining us on the dais for this item and then we'll continue with council members. Thank you, council president. Let me first say that in my family, alcoholism and drug addiction has been part of it. Unfortunately, we've had to battle I'm sure it extends to many, many families in this city and across this country. So this is certainly an issue that rings close to home for me. And historically, I can go back to my days on the Planning Commission back in 2001. These are issues back then and before then, so they've continued. I want to thank uh, former Councilman Oliver Baines, who actually started the initial process that was taken up by the three council members, Chavez, Nelson, and uh, Arias. And I want to thank those council members for listening to me and, uh, and taking on this massive project. That's what it is, it's taken a long time. I think it's at least two years in the making. But part of our discussions we had yesterday when I, to address some of the issues I had was one, developing a program to incentivize ABC licenses that have been revoked and basically offer somebody come in and new with a probably a committee of the mayor and see a council subcommittee in consultation with the PD and the ABC to incentivize, instead of having to buy two licenses, you can buy one license. And I know there's gonna be a text amendment that's part of the record that will start next week to define these new neighborhood uh, grocery markets that I think I are a step in the right direction. I would ask that include an advisory panel that it, of experts to make sure we do it properly and uh, timely. And as Council Member Chavez has said earlier, there's a variance provision, and I think the city attorney said it's gotta be added on. But that variance provision, when it is in there, will allow an existing store right now to actually go ahead prior to the uh, text amendment, so there's a lot of flexibility. And I, what I do like about this act is that it does provide at least one annual code enforcement visit. A lot of these stores have simply not been uh, seen by code enforcement, but at least one annual inspection is a step in the right direction. And um, I know there's a one year review on this program to see uh, its, uh, its outcome. And just, a, you know, the, so the concerns I had were addressed by my meetings yesterday with this council subcommittee. And I'm now prepared to support the uh, Responsible Neighborhood uh, Act. And I, again, my Kudos to the committee who put it together and all the hard work you have. And I think it's a step in the right direction for the city of Fresno. Issues have been identified that we need to still continue to work on, but uh, this is a, a big first step. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and the council committee and the council appreciates your support of this uh, significant ordinance um, to clean up our city. With that council, I will move to, um, to see any of the council who would like to speak on this item. Thank you, Council President. I just want to thank everyone for their participation. Um, the residents that showed up here to be present and then those also that chimed in virtually. Um, obviously, this is an extremely important issue in our community that has impacted many neighborhoods for a very long time. I do applaud uh, my colleagues for the courage and their leadership in bringing something forward that will be a positive change um, for the future of our city. Um, 
I think that we all recognize that liquor stores are not what we want to see in our neighborhoods. And I think that we have heard loud and clear, not just today, but at least I've heard it for the last six years and even in my time before council that families want us to prioritize investments that improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods when it comes to parks, um, better schools, um, better housing. Those are the types of investments that they want to see in, in their neighborhood. They do want to see um, grocery stores, and they recognize that. So it's not something that um, we haven't talked about before. In fact, this council earlier this morning um, supported in the, um, in the consent calendar an ordinance that I brought forward many years ago to uh, try to incentivize grocery stores. Um, what I find interesting is that the folks that oppose um, the proposal today have never showed support for the incentives that I had proposed um, six years ago or five years ago to waive actually impact fees and incentivize these small grocery stores to come to the neighborhoods that are being impacted by liquor stores. So um, just find it very interesting. But I do you know, wanna say that I'm in strong support of what we're trying to do. I believe that this is a step forward. Um, it's gonna create the tools so that we can go after the bad actors. And I think that there's a commitment that we do want our code enforcement um, to be out there. I've seen in my residence in District 1 have seen the immediate impact of having a saturated, saturated liquor licenses in various neighborhoods. I have a neighborhood on Shields and West that is impacted tremendously because of the vagrancy of the homelessness of the alcohol addiction of all these liquor licenses in four corners and then you have a recycling center so you can imagine what an attractive nuisance that becomes and how it erodes the quality of life our residents are tired of that they're tired of the same old same mm -hmm. old and so um, when anyone in this city and i invite any developer that would love to bring this forward because I would stand with them in support and if we have to do a variance, we'll do the variance because I do believe that we need to invest in, in attracting more grocery stores, that we will do whatever we can, that we will lift any rock to make sure that grocery stores, that healthy options are afforded um, to our community. So I wanna thank everyone for um, the work that they've done over the last one one plus years in getting to today. Thank you. Council Vice President, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Council President. I wanted, uh, I think uh, uh, Mayor Brand forgot that when our, uh, our good friend uh, Oliver Baines III brought this up, I was his co-sponsor on that. And we did our best to bring this forward. As my colleagues are nodding, yeah, they remember. So, but the problem then was we didn't have uh, council support. And, uh, and, and that was a tragedy. But we laid the foundation to a degree, and that foundation was based on the Roosevelt High School students that came in with their petitions, with their statistics, with their charts. And Oliver and I uh, totally agreed with them. But again, unfortunately, the council, uh, my colleague back there in the back who spoke, you remember that. So it was a, these kids were really great. I mean, they were, they, they did their homework, uh, down to the I's, cross the T's. They'd all make good lawyers, by the way. Uh, with that work, that, that product that came from that, uh, that meeting or meetings. We had several, actually. So I'm happy to see it come to uh, the point where we're ready to vote on it today. Uh, congratulations to my colleagues who picked up the uh, situation and carried it over the uh, goal line. I appreciate that as well. And I, I just wanted to say that for me, our entire community, the entire community of Fresno, when you move into an area, you have expectations. And I think things like this disrupt those expectations of your community, whether it's north, south, east, or west. And I, I don't like to disrupt that expectation. And if an area is zoned for whatever, that doesn't mean it's entitled to have that in my view. There's a by right it, uh, paragraph or clause, et cetera. But I'm sure when people, uh, at least when I purchased my home 40 something years ago, I was never told about different things that could, maybe, should, would. The deal was I want this house and I could afford it and let's, let's conclude the transaction. So again, uh, I don't want to disrupt expectations of neighborhoods. Uh, I've had a lot of calls from the north end of town as well as my district, as well as uh, other areas. And I respect those calls pro and con. Uh, but the voice that I hear today 
uh, requires that I support uh, this motion that's being brought today. So a job well done by not only the council, but especially the citizens. And we do hear you. Sometimes people think we don't. We do listen and we do care, but we have to get in a position to carry the voice and vote the vote forward to prevail in situations like this and other, other times. So again, thanks everyone for, for listening, your participation, your patience. It takes time, but we finished. We got to the line, so thank you. Thank you, Council Vice President. Thank you and Councilmember Baines for uh, setting the foundation for today's vote. Councilmember Bredefield, you have the floor. Yeah, for, uh, first of all, I wanna uh, commend my colleagues, uh, Council President Arias, uh, Esparza, Saria, uh, for working on this and uh, really doing a, a yeoman's job in terms of pushing this for a, a long time. Uh, I know uh, Councilman uh, Aria, uh, Arias, you, you, you inherited some of these difficulties and challenges and you've been taking them on, so I, I really do commend you for that. And um, several things I want to address in terms of some of the issues related to this and perhaps uh, Councilmember Chavez. And, and Councilmember Chavez, I want to also commend you too. I know you've worked on this and very hard on it as well. Um, could you explain specifically when you say that the variance regarding the grocery stores, exactly what that means and what this allows. Yeah. I have some concerns about some of uh, what's in here in terms of the potentially preventing grocery stores, the very type of markets we want to come into neighborhoods to be able to come into the neighborhoods. I mean, we all agree the oversaturation of the liquor stores. Um, and so I think there may be some unintended uh, negative consequences of this, and I want to root those out and, and make sure it's not a problem, but I think you're trying to address that. So I, if, if I can, Council Member Chavez, as I understood Council Member Chavez's comments, he's open to bringing back a variance at the next meeting that will ensure that grocery stores um, can come forward um, uh, as part of this development. It should also be noted that grocery stores right now also give their development fees waived as an incentive that was approved this morning for an additional two years into 2022, which was sponsored by Councilwoman Soria. So um, the details of that variance would have to be, you know, written up, you know, uh, um, fleshed out by Council Member Chavez and um, legal counsel, go ahead. Hello, I'd like to clarify. I know um, that we speak in a different language as lawyers, but I did want to clarify that Councilmember Chavez has um, requested to bring forward a resolution of initiation next week, which will allow for an exemption that would foster the ability to bring more neighborhood markets. What, what does that mean? Right. Let, let, me, let me chime in here because uh, I think this is important. And, you know, Councilmember Bredefeld, so it, in order to simplify this, so if you can think of a neighborhood market of a concept, and, you know, I, I mentioned earlier an Aldi. Um, version of what this looks like, which is like essentially what one of the gentlemen spoke about, like a Trader Joe's that has options that include fresh fruits, vegetables, dairy products, baked goods, deli meats, um, you know, a, a little mini uh, meat area. Um, we have these concepts um, within our city. Uh, they're actually what a neighborhood market was before supermarkets uh, came in the picture. And, and it's essentially a place where folks would have access to these um, products. And, and, and so I think the purpose of this was to incentivize those. Um, and I think Council Member Soria uh, developed that uh, process for, by way of incentives, but that's what we actually want in our community. And that's really the intent to incentivize those um, and quite frankly, um, reduce the number of liquor stores, which as I define a liquor store, is you walk into some of my district, they have 30% of shelf space of just liquor and booze um, and, you know, chips and, you know, these uh, uh, perishable, uh, non-perishable uh, goods. Um, that's not what a neighborhood market is. And that's why I want to put that provision where, one, they will come and meet with the council member, make sure that this fits the neighborhood. Um, two, uh, meet with the implementation committee, i.e. our residents that have their eyes and ears on the ground. And then should that uh, satisfy both areas, we bring in the council for consideration um, on what that would look like, right? So uh, I, I really intended to make sure that the residents are, you know, have a huge say in what actually goes into their neighborhoods. And, you know, I'm sure that, you know, some of these will come up here in the next year or so, um, maybe some in my district, maybe some in your district. 
And actually, I'll, I'll flag it for my council colleagues. I, I do have a couple of those in, in the queue already, uh, and I want that in my neighborhood. So that's really what the, the definition of what a neighborhood market is in my eyes. Okay, and so, and I appreciate that. I, I frankly like it. And so, uh, does that delay this uh, process at all by coming back next? I'm asking the city attorney. Uh, does that delay it at all, city attorney? No, if this ordinance is approved today, okay. uh, when signed by the mayor, then it will be effective 30 days after that, regardless of what else, what other changes you want to make after that. Okay. The other changes that are being proposed would be on a parallel track, and then they would be effective whenever that process is complete. Okay, so I want to make sure. So let's say, for example, there are three uh, liquor stores um, on three corner, three out of four corners in southwest Fresno, and a grocery store, as we define it, as Councilmember Chavez was talking about, wants to go on the fourth corner. Without that variance, that grocery store wouldn't be allowed, but with the variance, it would. Is that, is that accurate? If the- That's, that's correct. Assuming correct. council would ultimately approve it, yes. Okay, and that's important to me, because I think right. that takes away some of the problems that would be there, and so I appreciate that, and I, and I wanna also um, acknowledge Councilmember Chavez, I didn't mean to overlook you. I know you've been actively involved in this, and so, Kudos to you as, as well as the others for what you've accomplished. And uh, so I appreciate that variance very much. One of the other problems that, that I'm concerned about are what's on uh, page 15, which is the, the licenses uh, that have to be purchased uh, beyond just the one for the ABC license. So if there's less than 10,000 square feet, you have to buy two and uh, get rid of one, 10 to 30,000 square feet, there's three, and then there's two to get rid of, and then more than 30,000 square feet, you have to buy four uh, and get rid of three, correct? I mean, I, I think that's the way it is. And so those licenses, uh, my concern is uh, they're gonna skyrocket. Uh, I, I think when you limit something, uh, it becomes more valuable, and clearly those licenses will uh, go up. That is a, a fear for me in the sense that when we do have a potential grocery store that wants to move in, whatever the size, they're gonna look at the costs of paying those for those additional licenses, and for some it's gonna be cost prohibitive. Uh, you know, we can speculate what, that, what those licenses are gonna be, uh, but it is gonna be cost prohibitive, and they're, they're gonna go somewhere else, to Madeira or Close, or where they don't have to pay those fees. And so, uh, what I would like to do uh, is bring back um, uh, something where uh, we, we give some kind of credit to those potential stores, grocery stores, um, perhaps a 50% uh, credit against anything above the one license they have to buy. So if they have to buy an additional license, they get a 50% credit against our city fees, sales tax, whatever. Uh, if there's th uh, three additional licenses and it costs them $300,000 above the initial license, they would get a credit from the fees they have to pay to the city as well as sales tax. I think that helps in terms of prospective businesses and the kind of businesses we want to be attracting to the city of Fresno. Uh, if we don't do that, my fear is uh, we will continue the, the anti-business uh, difficult uh, business reputation the city of Fresno has, and it, that's an un unintended consequence of this. I don't think any of us want to do that. We want to attract the quality stores into our neighborhoods. So that's something I'll, I'll bring uh, back. Uh, what's your feeling about that in terms of the sponsors? Uh, a, a couple of points, um, Council Member Burr. Um, in your analogy of West Fresno, one corner has three liquor stores. Um, one of the challenges has been is that no grocery store would come in to a block that has three liquor stores. One, because there's a saturation of alcohol. Two, because of the nuisance and crime that it attracts. And three, there isn't any disposable income left in that neighborhood to warrant a grocery store. So this has been one of the problems is that simply a fourth license or a convenience store or a healthy market that is simply a disguise for another convenience store or liquor store is what we're trying to avoid. So I, I just want to tell you that we spend a lot of time trying to understand the market. And one of the impediments in West Fresno is the dozens and dozens and dozens of establishments like these make it a, um, it's prohibitive to actually attracting the grocery store that we're looking for. Um, secondly, 
I'm always open to um, exploring and um, considering how we provide incentives for grocery stores. So to your proposal, I'm open to it. As long as it's not given to the 7-Eleven, the convenience store, sure. the Chevron, or the liquor store that is gonna be rebranded as a healthy store. So if it's a grocery store that brings non-perishables, right now a grocery store is considered 50%, you know, prepare at home, rice, pastas, beans, 30% perishable fruits, vegetables, meats, dailies, milk. As long as it's a grocery store, because that's what people want, I am more than happy to figure out how we incentivize, if that means waiving additional fees beyond what we're, what we're, what's already in place now with Councilwoman's bill that the council approved this morning, I'm happy to do so. Yeah, I, I, I think we're on the same page. I mean, of course, we want you know healthy stores coming in, grocery stores, true grocery stores, and I think they're easy to define. You've started that. Um, and so there are clear definitions of what are grocery stores versus liquor stores. And so um, I will look, sit down and, and look at that and, and consult with you, and, and we'll bring something forward that, that helps everybody. Yeah, another uh, issue, people express the you know, difficulty uh, getting uh, the big grocery store in, in southwest Fresno, a Vons, a Save Mart. Um, what will that take from your perspective um, you know, Council President Arias, um, I remember uh, being on the council before we had difficulty trying to, to get that and, and here we are some, some time later still um, trying to make that happen. Um, I, I guess, you know, with the, the food max, but that's obviously not the same thing as uh, a true bonds or a save mark. What, what's needed? Um, is it uh, incentives? Is it, because, you know, I think this council last yesterday I mean, you had proposed five million dollars for the parks. Um, you know, I pointed out where, you know, I think there's uh, three million dollars that's misappropriated and two million dollars that we can be utilizing that are general fund dollars. I have no problem taking those dollars and incentivizing a bonds and a save mart to come into Southwest Fresno. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Is because I'm open to that. Uh, I want to do what we can to make that happen, and I think everything should be on the table. I'm always open to that, and um, before I scare the mayor with you know giving away millions of dollars to Save Mart or or, or, or bonds, um, I, I want to tell you that my lesson after 22 months in understanding the industry and the situation in Fresno, and having worked in a convenient gas station as 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 a young college kid, is that the physical environment that has resulted out after decades of saturation is the biggest impediment to a grocery store. It's a physical environment of saturation, of crime and blight that is keeping a, a bigger store. When they have come in, uh, uh, Vallarta is a perfect example. They thrive. You know, the Vallarta in Southeast Fresno, the one on Clinton and Nine, when they open, they thrive. There is a demand for them, but it is a physical environment that we have created over a 35 period, a 35 year period of approving every alcohol licenses without having the accountability. That's why this, this proposal includes annual inspections where people risk to lose their conditional use permit if they don't clean up their act. So I think it's a combination of managing what's there, holding them accountable, not adding more saturation, and in providing the environmental, um, the physical, and maybe the financial incentives beyond what the councilman already has. If you're a grocery store, you don't pay development fees in Fresno. That's a pretty significant uh, incentive already. We just have to um, help bring them here by, I think, cleaning up what's unfortunately been allowed to occur for 40 years. Councilmember Bredefield, I think uh, you bring up a good point um, that, you know, we, notwithstanding this ordinance, I mean, it's something we should be looking at. Um, I, I think some of the issues that were addressed by some of the folks in opposition to the ordinance we're kind of dealing in hypotheticals right now because uh, unfortunately we don't have grocery stores climbing over themselves to, to build in my district or in council member Arias's district. Um, and so, you know, as, as you mentioned, as you alluded to, and as I mentioned earlier in my, my remarks, when we cap this market, it's going to create this new market w within the licenses. And, uh, I think, I mean, I'm not, I certainly think there's something we should do in terms of incentivizing grocery stores, but, you know, we should see what what the market looks like. I mean, see how it unfolds, see what that equilibrium price uh, kind of starts to float around and, and how cost prohibitive that is. Is a grocery store, a grocery chain like Aldi's 
is that going to be cost prohibitive for them? And, and then I think they're an international company. I don't know. Well, um, council so members so I, think, uh, I think we should be having this conversation notwithstanding the ordinance. And I appreciate no, I, you doing I, that. I agree. And can, can you I ask a clarifying, say clarifying yeah. question on this? Um, what is the dollar value of the fee that's being waived to incentivize um, these markets from going in? It's dependent on the development fee that each the, the applicant pays. Every application is get, different. Can we get a range? Because I want to I want to see what that dollar value is compared to the increased cost for those licenses they have to surrender. Because when we limit the market and limit the supply, uh, uh, then costs go up. Yeah. So I, I just want to understand if we're comparing apples to apples here, because we can talk to folks and tell them what they want to hear and talk about these great incentives. But if in reality we're just passing false promises. I think we need to be very, very clear to the public what we're talking about. So, if council the member, really an I, I, I think that's a fair question, and I think we can fully vet that question when the council member brings his proposal forward. Okay, and so let, let me just say one thing. I wrap up on terms of this incentivizing. You know, we, uh, as a city, uh, mayors before, when we have gone after airlines, when we have gone after the Gap, we have gone to them. And we have tried to work out ways to bring them here. And so I, I think we ought to be, if, if District 7 is in great need of that, and uh, certainly District 3 is in great need of that, we ought to find a site, and we ought to find an incentive package, and we ought to find a, a group, a council member, mayor, uh, to go to these companies and say, we want you here. Uh, what, what's it going to take? And rather than waiting for them to arrive at our door, uh, we need to go to them, and I think that's what needs to happen uh, in these areas. And I would be fully supportive of that and fully supportive of incentive packages to make that happen. And uh, that's going to take action, so I'm, I'm fully supportive of uh, in the, moving in that direction. I will be supporting this today. Um, it's not a perfect bill, as I've outlined, but I think it will continue to improve um, as we have the variance, as we provide... Uh, credits for uh, real uh, grocery stores that we want in the neighborhood. And I will just point out one thing. I mean, people have known uh, my opposition to uh, having the marijuana dispensaries. I just find it ironic that people are very concerned about all of the proliferation of alcohol and stores, and yet the council has breathlessly been putting in marijuana dispensaries, and we've gone into the uh, manufacturing and distribution of marijuana. So. It's a little bit ironic for me, having said that. I don't want to rain on their parade, but I'm going to support this today. Thank you, Councilmember. For the last word, we'll go to Councilmember Carbossi. If you have any words before we vote, I appreciate that, Council President. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the people that spoke today, especially Aaron Foster. With the high increase in gang violence we're having and the gang shootings in the city, we need him now more than ever to help reduce that problem we're having. And his words um, do carry a lot of weight with me. Um, just so we can offer a different picture, first of all, um, I appreciate you sharing with me the petition. Um, I haven't seen that petition. I'm sure you'll show it to me later. But I have seen hundreds of emails in my box in opposition. So I'm trying to weigh all the factors here without emotion. The Aldi example. So I actually do have an Aldi going up in my district at Shaw and West. Um, for the past five years, there used to be a strip mall there. Uh, there used to be an Office Max and what was called the Tang Dynasty. And for the residents that live there, they understand this is a big problem because we have a neighborhood right behind that shopping center um, that had, it's, it's a 55 and plus neighborhood, and they've had a lot of problems because there has been a lot of illegal dumping, there has been a lot of uh, homeless homelessness and small fires created back there, and they're worried about their safety. We don't have the money as a city to go in there constantly and clean it up and keep and have upkeep when those shopping centers are left vacant. One tool I have is when somebody decides to invest in this city, one, they're creating a market, but they're also cleaning up an entire area. So that helps me to do my job. And without that outside investment, I will not be able to stop the illegal dumping, to stop all the uh, vandalism we have in that area, and to keep my senior residents safe. And this is a problem in other areas. Now, there are, I'm, I'm really appreciative of Council Member Chavez at the, you know, I know it's the 11th hour, we're making this change. But this variance does have potential to help deal with this problem because up until this morning, this bill made it virtually impossible, incentives aside, it made it impossible to actually create neighborhood markets. So what I'd like to say 
is here's my, comp my issue, and I've had this issue, and I've made it clear, and, and I don't think there's going to be any uh, negotiation here. But my problem with this bill is it gives a monopoly to existing liquor stores in saturated areas while blocking markets that sell fresh produce from going in, despite the variance. You know, it's called the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act, but it doesn't do anything to present single sale alcohol. It doesn't do anything to hold the people accountable that have been causing the greatest problem in our neighborhoods, in those liquor stores, by our parks and our schools. They are the problem, and this bill gives them a free pass and raises the value of their businesses by limiting the number of, of licenses. That is an unintended consequence that we are discussing right now, so I'm gonna call it an intended consequence. Here's my biggest problem in District 2. This is poison. This is a single serve bottle of alcohol. And the people that are causing the problem, those bad liquor store owners, are gonna continue to be able to sell this, not just in my district, but in neighborhoods south of Shaw. We haven't addressed the elephant in the room. That's why I can't support this bill. Where is the police and code enforcement to go after these bad actors? I'm a new council member. What have we been doing these last four, five, six, seven, eight years to stop this? And that's why I'm voting no. Because this, Cal you know, this is classic California. I love this state. But we keep passing these feel-good bills like Prop 47 and 57 saying, oh, we'll fix it later. Why? Let's fix it now. To our youth out there, here's what I want to say to you. The Youth Leadership Institute is a great organization. I remember what it was like being a young person. I'm 37 now. I know what it was like when you're passionate and you believe in something because you're the one paying the consequence. You have to walk to school, walk with your siblings to school, and you have to see garbage. You have to see crime. You have to live it every day. And believe it or not, it does happen in District 2 as well. But here's my concern. You don't deserve a false promise. You deserve results. There are issues with this bill. It's called the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act. It doesn't stop the irresponsible liquor stores. And I, I really do apologize that I can't vote with you on this. Perhaps if we had been working together earlier, we could have worked together. But we live in a very different era in American politics today. And I hope after this election day, we'll get back to normal. But you've seen some of the language here today. You know, this doesn't have to be a country where it's false choices. It's either or. You're with us or against us. If we all want a good community, we have to work together. The very people that invest in my neighborhoods that we want to invest in Southwest Fresno, these are the people that we should also include in the conversation because we need their money to build these neighborhood markets. But if we see, call them special interests and vilify them and don't want them, then guess what? We're going to pass all the policies that sound good and feel good, but they're not going to get anything done, and you're going to be left with a false promise. If we can improve this bill, I'll vote for it. I'm trying to find a way to vote for it, but I haven't been able to do that today. I really appreciate what you're doing and your passion. I think we'll get there one day, but I want to stop this. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, before we go to a vote, I just want to remind the, the council that I appreciate the comments from the public and about code enforcement police. Uh, the police chief was just here this week. There's a record amount of shootings. I think it's fair to say that the police department has their hands full. Our code enforcement have been doing pandemic enforcement uh, face masks, I think it's fair that, to say that they have their hands full. Um, and ultimately, any of us at any day can bring forward a bill to ban all single sale. So if that's what my colleagues want to do, I, I look forward to that process, that conversation, and I welcome that conversation amongst us. Uh, City Clerk, roll call. Council Member Bredefeld? Yes. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Carbarson. As friendly and no as possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Member Chavez. Council Member Soria. Yes. Council Member Capriolia. Council Vice President Capriolia. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. President Arias. An absolute yes. Thank you all for this time, and we're going to break for lunch, and we'll see you at 2 o'clock. Thank you to the youth of our city and our residents and everybody who called in today.
attending virtually, Councilmember Bradfield, Carbasi, and myself physically present in the chambers. Let's proceed with the items that were pulled. We have gone through item 2L, 2O, and now we're down to item 2BB. Councilmember Bradfield, you pulled that item. Okay, so <clears throat> the issue that uh, I was wondering about, we are, I guess, awarding $1.5 million to the Fresno Arts Council uh, to look at art and culture institution and giving institutions and giving them grants between $10,000 and $150,000. Uh, I guess it'll be awarded to local museums, but it's a, it crosses out museum, it says institutions, how are we defining uh, these institutions? On the second part of this, we're giving art and culture grants between 10 and 25,000 to local performing art programs. And how are we defining that? How will this be determined? Um, that's my first question. And if I may, this was sponsored by the COVID committee. So I know Council Member Chavez is online and Council Member's a little late to reconvene after an interview. But the word institution was um, used because um, not everything is considered an official museum. So for example, um, the Veterans Memorial has a Veterans Museum in there, right. but it's not designated as an official museum like uh, a Met would, museum would be. So we wanted to make sure there was a de definition to accurately allow as many potential museum um, amenities to apply for the resources. The second question, if I understood you, is what criteria are we going to use for the amount? Yeah. Um, I was actually going to default to Council Missouri because she's been the lead on this. Unless our legal counsel can um, outline the criteria, I don't know if, if you have anything to add or we can wait for Council Missouri when she returns. If you want to wait, we can wait. Okay. Let's, if you don't mind, Councilman Bradfield, can no, we go to your wait. item 2CCD? 2CC? Can we go to two DD? Because that that one involves Council Minnesota too. Oh, okay. Two DD. Yes. Let's see two DD. All right. Let's, uh, let me let me get to that. Two DD. It is um, adopted thirtieth oh. amendment, of forty four thousand of CARES Act for a mask up, CB campaign. Okay, so a couple of questions on the expenditure list from uh, Barrios Unidos. Uh, they have. Fourth, so this is this is I guess for some kind of mask campaign, um, and they uh, want four thousand dollars for youth stipend, sixteen times two hundred fifty dollars to for stipends for youth to design, post, share, and highlight the COVID nineteen mask campaign, and then what they call influencer stipends, four thousand uh, dollars as well for that, and then um, they have something called U Spark for $2,000, which is a youth media company to share campaign and uplift youth and influence, influence or narrative. So I, I'm a little confused by this in terms of a mass campaign. What, what is this mass campaign and yeah. what are we doing? We can answer that, uh, Council President. Um, so as, as you know, Council Member Bredefeld, we've been working with um, the County Public Health Department and, and really tracking the data and the numbers that are coming out. And as we've seen, you know, we have our older population that have been really, you know, using a lot of precautions, CDC guidelines, the mask. Um, and so those numbers have been decreasing. What we've seen in the trend um, has been the young folks that um, have tested positive. Um, and obviously, a lot of them are asymptomatic, which, you know, is, is great for them, but not so great for the older folks that they could be around aunts, uncles, grandpa grandparents, etc. And so what this really intends to do is to reach that segment of the population um, to ensure that they have the information, that they know the consequences, and more importantly, that they stay healthy. And so these are various um, means of, 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 of mediums to reach them. Um, we know that they don't traditionally you know, watch um, the, the old school TV, as some of them uh, put it, but they're very active on social media. They're very active within organizations. And this was a way to ensure that they reach that message, one, and two, that they take all the CDC health and local public health precautions. 
um, i.e. wearing a mask, i.e. the hand sanitizer, i.e. the social distancing. And so this is an effort to really address those numbers that we've seen increasing um, with young folks. So what you're saying is you're using young folks to reach young folks, is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I, I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit it, but I didn't know what an influencer was until recently. <laughs> um, and apparently these folks are really popular uh, on social media and they have a number of followers. Um, uh, private companies actually use them to market and um, really, you know, make available products, services, things of that sort. So this was one of the mediums that we chose to, um, you know, use in order to ensure that that message gets reached to them. Okay. And, and Councilman, I think the official definition of influencer is somebody unlike us that has more than 2,000 Twitter followers. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but yes, um, it is, we're using young people to convince young people to wear a mask whenever they're out and to be safe. Um, and this is a pretty interesting and innovative proposal from young people. Okay. All right. Um, Do we have a motion? Well, with, with, with that, I'll make the motion. Motion to approve by Councilor Chavez. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Member Esparza. All right. Let's do roll call on this. Council Member Bredefeld? Yes. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Carbasi? Council Member Soria? Absent. Council Vice President Capriolio? Yes. And President Absolutely. Arias? Thank you. Council Member, do you mind if I just um, do a point of order and, and go back to um, Council comments first before sure. we go to the next items? Um, I know <coughs> Council Member Vice President wanted to go into co Council comments when we came back in. So if you don't mind, we'll start with our Council Vice President. You can engage in um, Council comments. Should have gave you a little warning. I just took a big mouthful of peanuts for my dessert from lunch, my protein. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to thank Thank Pardini and their staff for getting the food boxes to our seniors. Uh, we can't express the gratitude enough for the hard work they've been doing. Not only to distribute the food, but all the positive comments that we've received from the seniors about this program. And I'm sort of speaking for and looking for their confirmation from members Chavez and Carbasi because they were key ingredients to getting this, uh, so to speak, to get these uh, food boxes put together. Uh, thanks to the Fresno State Police Department, Northeast Police Department, uh, for all their help in these events. Uh, today, we moved. Uh, Brianna, could you show us a picture? So, right there, that's the perfect one. Uh, not that one. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the uh, new location at 6th and Shaw. As you know, the council approved a recreational slash uh, center at 6th and Shaw. And so this, we've got fresh pavement and we're now facilitating the senior meal for my district four at that location. Next slide. So this uh, shows the truck, it's a refrigerated truck that transports the boxes to the location. And then we, uh, we pre-qualify people so they make sure they're seniors and that they uh, fulfill the expectations of our program. So with that, uh, that same uh, diagram, if you'll note the drawing there, it's really exciting. This is uh, the result of my colleagues approving of my financing to put this recreational slash community center together at that location. So there are two buildings, it's hard to tell from the diagram, but there's a smaller building, it's 3,700 square feet. The one above it's about 3,900 square feet. And so we met yesterday with the fantastic staff from the mayor's office, uh, city, uh, city manager, and uh, Jim Shad and their representatives. We walked through it, we diagrammed it. This was produced uh, by the department and it's fantastic. So now we're gonna work from that to facilitate more senior activities, to facilitate more activities generally once we complete it, once we get it open, once the COVID kind of backs down. So I could go on for a long time on, on this, and I appreciate everyone's support. Uh, next uh, picture, if we have one. I thought we had one more. No, two of them. Yeah, that shows the entrance. So they make a left turn, go in. This building you see there, those two buildings, it's hard to determine, too, because they're stacked with each other. But that's the facility we're talking about. 
I think we we're like at 330 meals today uh, at this location. And uh, as I said, the people are so, uh, so appreciative. So we're going to continue the development of that project that my colleagues authorized and, and so forth, and we'll keep it going. So, sorry? I didn't hear you. 4.30. Four thirty that means something. We'll talk about it. <laughs> oh, four hundred thirty meals. Oh, I thought you meant like four thirty in the afternoon. I'm going. I thought we'll still be here. What are we going to do? Uh, so I stand corrected. My staff just got back. So four hundred thirty meals. So a, a couple more little things. So last Thursday we were at the old location, Vinland Elementary, and at that location uh, we really have a great bunch of people out there. Not only residents but the police and others. And why do I say that? We had a homeless person there last week, hadn't eaten, had not eaten, not eaten in three days. Detective Kim from the Northeast and Sergeant Gavell from Fresno State, Big John, stepped in, got food for the individual. Didn't stop there. So with the help of Gloria Myers, Gloria, I hope you're hearing me at the mayor's office, and the hero team, uh, this individual got the help he needed to get off the streets. It was a success. We got him off the streets. With that, the way they handled it, that is that team, uh, and the passion and, and the gentleness with this individual, it was remarkable. So Stanley now has new clothes, shoes, and new hope for a better life. So uh, I thank those unsung heroes. Uh, two more, three more things. Earlier this month, we celebrated Peace Day at Fresno State. A uh, very exciting moment with President Castro and some of my colleagues. We also just attended and celebrated uh, the Armenian flag raising just outside our chamber here. And I want to thank uh, all those who coordinated that for us. Finally, Public Works, uh, all the work they do in D4. Uh, we completed some much needed paving projects. Awesome team. Brian, you guys are awesome. Uh, by the way, the entrance to the building you just saw, all fresh pavement. The parking lot, all fresh. So we're, uh, I'm closing out like a, a, a meteor. We're going strong right to the end. Uh, and then finally, uh, FACS, uh, they did the upgrades uh, at the bus stops in front of Hoover High and Duncan Tech High School. So everybody in the city is working so hard for all the people, and I can't thank them enough. There are many more, but I don't want to get the blah, blah, blah award today. So thank you, Council President. Any other council member wishing to share public comments? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, I'll keep it uh, brief as always. Uh, so a couple weeks ago, we had a, our third uh, COVID mobile testing clinic over at McLean High School uh, and tested, I think, just over 100 folks uh, there at that site. Uh, that was our third one. We previously had one at Manchester uh, Center and another at uh, Roosevelt High. Um, additionally, uh, we, cast, we held a couple of EISD meetings uh, through the Public Financing Authority and we uh, solidified uh, and officially formed the Fresno Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District. Uh, so I want to thank Council again for their support um, on, on that item. Um, the PFA did uh, approve, make a final approval, and so that, that district is now uh, fully formed. And uh, I will yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Any other members of the Council wishing to address this? To yeah, address can, can, public comment? Council President? You have the floor. Just uh, really briefly, I, I want to thank uh, UCSF um, folks. We'll be working with the mobile health unit and doing the specific targeted event um, at Mosqueda in the Butler Park uh, neighborhood. We're working with our partner uh, with the um, African American um, Equity Project, um, Shante over at EOC. So we'll be bringing some uh, resources, some health screening, um, trying to get folks some support for the pandemic and uh, COVID um, testing. Um, and then also some other um, resources that will be available. But I, I also want to um, take the opportunity to um, flag for um, the council. Uh, there'll be an item coming next week. Um, and this was really brought on by a lot of the youth at the Sunnyside um, High School area. As you know, the last meeting, um, we adjourned in the memory of, of, of Principal Tim Lyles. And so a, an item will be coming uh, forward next week to uh, rename the Sunnyside Entryway into uh, Lyle's way um, after uh, in his memory and, and after Principal Lyle's. Um, so I wanna thank all the young people that uh, emailed and 
uh, tweeted and tagged me and, and you know I, I heard you and and I appreciate that and I and I agree with them and so we're going to be bringing that uh, forward for the council consideration next week. Thank you. Thank you, council. Any other comments from the council? Seeing none, we're going to try and buy the council a little more time. So we're going to get on to the timed items and then we'll return to the consent items that are were pulled for individual discussion and vote. The first item is at 10 a.m. is a TEFRA hearing to hear and consider information concerning the proposed insurance and tax exempt California Enterprise Development Authority for the purpose of financing the United Health Centers of San Joaquin Valley. We're going to go ahead and open up the hearing. Any member of the public wishing to speak to the council on this item during this public hearing? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. Um, Can I make a motion to approve? Motion to approve by Member Bredefield. I will second. Any questions of the council? Seeing none. Uh, yeah, council President. Yes. I, I would like to hear just a, a brief uh, presentation from staff on this item. Perfect. Mr. Lima, can you proceed, please? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Council. Mike Lima, Finance Director, Controller. Before you today is a resolution approving the issuance of no more than $12 million in tax exempt bonds by the California Enterprise Development Authority on behalf of United Health Centers. The bond proceeds will be used for the financing or refinancing of bonds used to fund the construction and equipping of two United Health Centers facilities, one at 645 South Mini Wawa Avenue and the other at 6810 North Milburn Avenue. Under the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act, or TEFRA, the governing body of the entity where the facilities that gain the benefit from the bond issue are located must hold a hearing to receive public testimony and approve the issuance of the refunding bonds. This hearing was noticed on the city's website on September 16, 2020, and as of today, we've received no testimony either for or against the proposed action. Payments of these bonds would be the sole responsibility of the California Enterprise Development Authority from their revenue streams. The city will have no obligation or liability associated with these facilities or these bonds. Staff recommends the council conduct the required TEFRA hearing and at its conclusion adopt the resolution approving the issuance of bonds by the California Enterprise Development Authority. Thank you. Thank you, staff. And for the record, there is no financial liability to the city with this process. It's simply a public hearing since we are the local jurisdiction where the facilities are being built. I, I, I guess, uh, Mike, uh, you could just, just for the record, how how does this, if in any way, uh, relate back to the financing that we approved on the consent a little earlier, just for the record? It does not. There's no connection between the two other than both items are for United Health Centers. Thank you. Yep. And, and for the record, um, those items were tabled to next week's agenda. So technically, the council did not approve those items either, but they are two seven distinct items. There, there, there was a big pool of them, so I must have missed those. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, it's been a lot of uh, movement with budget going on at the same time. Uh, it looks like we're ready to roll call vote, please. Councilmember Bredefeld? Yes. Councilmember Chavez? Yes. Councilmember Esparza? Aye. Councilmember Carbasi? Yes. Councilmember Soria? Absent. Council Vice President Capriolio? Yes. And President Arias? Yes. The next item is 1015 hearing to consider a planning amendment number P200577, a rezone application in District 5. I will go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is there any member of the public wishing to speak, speak to this rezone application? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. Council Member Chavez, would you like to make a motion on your item? Yeah, motion to approve. Second. All right, motion been made by Council Member Chavez, second by Council so Vice President Capriolio. Roll call, please. Councilmember Bredefeld? Yes. Councilmember Chavez? Yes. Councilmember Esparza? Aye. Councilmember Carbasi? Aye. Councilmember Soria? Council Vice President Capriolio? Yes. President Arias? Yes. We will move on to the 1025 public hearing. It's a hearing to consider rezone application P200596 in District 4. Let me go to the public. Is there any member of the public wishing to address this rezone application? Yes. Seeing none. 2025, 1025, sorry. Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Member uh, Capriolio. I'll second it. Roll call, please. Councilmember Bredefeld? Yes. Councilmember Chavez? Yes. 
Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Farbasi? Aye. Council uh, Member Soria? Council Vice President Capriolio? Yes. President Arias? Yes. Now we go to the 1020 hearing, which I unfortunately skipped. Application number 200957. It is a hearing to consider a planned and rezone application. This is in District 2. Allow me to go to the public for any comment on this rezone application. Any member of the public wishing to speak to this rezone application? Seeing none, I'll come back to Councilmember Carbalsi. Would you like to make a motion? Motion to approve. Motion made by Member Carbalsi, second by Council Vice President Capriolio. Roll call, please. Council Member Bredefeld? Yes. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Carbasi? Yes. Council Member Soria? Okay. Yeah. Council Vice President Capriolio? Yes. And Council President Arias? We are on, next is a 1030 joint meeting of the Fresno Joint Powers Finance Authority, where Council Member um, Soria, myself, and the mayor are um, members of he, that authority. He's on his way if you could wait for a second. Sure, we will skip that item. Perfect, Council thank you. Councilwoman Soria. Um, we will go to legal counsel. Are you ready with item 4A to present? It's the um, authorizing and directing the finance to decline the city participation in the optional federal payroll deferral. Yeah, can you get them in? As they get them in, we're gonna switch things around and go back to the consent calendar. Um, the item that we're gonna take up next is item 2BB. Um, it was pulled by Council Member Bredefield. He had some questions for the sponsors. Council Member for the sponsor this item. It is the proposal to award $1.5 million of CARES Act to fund the um, cultural and arts um, communities that are struggling with some relief. But before we go there, we'll have legal counsel and let's skip to her really quick. Come on, legal counsel. Thanks for bearing with us as we move around, trying to catch up. We Thank are on the 4A as an apple, the general administration item. Council, um, Typically, this is an item that we would approve as a consent item, but I thought it was really important for the employees of the city to understand what this would mean by the council declining the participation, or if we were to choose otherwise to accept participation. So I asked legal counsel to provide a brief presentation to us so that the public employees who are watching and the general public can understand what the implications are. You may proceed. Thank you so much, Council President. Council Jenny DeRussi, City Attorney's Office, Deputy City Attorney, Labor and Employment. Uh, today we're talking about the optional payroll tax deferral program. We do have a brief PowerPoint that should be in front of you at this time. This came to us by executive order and it allows employers at their option to defer Social Security payroll taxes through the end of the current calendar year through 2020. Uh, the deferred taxes now must be paid back starting January 1st and no later than May 1st, 2021, or the, uh, they, are, they're real, they will accrue interest and penalties. And employers are responsible for managing the deferral and the repayment. Now, when we look at the impact of the city, many of you probably know that most city employees do not pay into Social Security tax. However, there are about 400 city employees, including most all temporary employees, who do pay Social Security tax. So those folks would be impacted. Social Security taxes amount to about 6.2% of the employee's gross income. So what that would mean is for now, if you wanted to opt into this program, the city would stop collecting that 6.2% of the gross income and the employee would see that on their paycheck. However, come January 1st, 2021, the city would effectively have to collect double the tax to pay back the 6.2% withheld now, as well as the 6.2% that would ordinarily be due. So employees would see a 14.4% deduction from their gross paycheck starting in January. Again, this is optional for employers, so it's totally a policy call whether or not to participate. Uh, there are, however, some things that our office and finance uh, would like council to understand when making this decision, uh, which are on the final slide. Here we see uh, that, I'm sorry, one more. 
sorry about that. Uh, there are several points. Uh, first is that finance has let the city attorney's office know that manual calculation of both the initial deferral as well as the payback would be required. Finance has opined that this would require additional personnel. And of course, whenever we're dealing with manual calculations, there is some room for error. Secondly, and this is a fairly big issue, that if an employee leaves the city between when the deferral starts and when the taxes are due, it is possible that the city could be liable to pay back those taxes. Now, this is an unknown liability because we have no way of knowing how many folks might leave city service between now and when the taxes are due, particularly with temporary employees. There's a lot of turnover in that area. And finally, as we've already discussed, impacted employees would have more pay now but they'd have a lot less pay later. And so there is some concern that employees may be confused and not realize that they're going to have to pay back these taxes. And although the city would be acting under the auspices of the federal government, when we go to collect that 12.4%, there may be some employees who are unhappy with that, who don't understand that that's going to occur. Um, but as I said, this is a policy call. This is up to you all. And I know finance is here to discuss more of the logistics from a city perspective. Thank you. Before we go to the council, is there, um, has, have we received any requests from our labor partners to exercise this discretion and uh, begin the collection? Or have, have they taken a position in, in any way? None that I'm aware of, Council President, but that would certainly be a good question for the, the personnel department, the labor manager. He may be able to more specifically, but, but certainly nothing has been brought to our attention. Okay. Let me bring it to the dais. Is there any questions from the council before have we, we consider action? Have we surveyed those employees that may be eligible for this um, tax deferral? Do you guys know? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Our office certainly has not. <clears throat> okay. It, was there a reason that we had to take a position? Well, uh, there's- Did have to come to the council? Well, there's no affirmative duty to act. If the employer decides not to opt in, you don't have to do anything. However, because this is an optional policy call, this was something that we wanted to seek council direction on uh, before the department just made its own determination. Yeah, council, um, I, I thought this is a pretty important decision if we're gonna you know, give employees what it looks like a temporary relief to require them to double back and pay that back a few months from now that I didn't want that decision just to be an administrative decision, but I wanted council to weigh in. Um, for me, it seems pretty clear that um, uh, it's not um, as good as it initially was thought to sound like, um, given that we would essentially be giving folks a temporary pay raise only to give them a, you know, a pay deduction downstream. But I wanted to have the council hear the item. Yeah, no, council I, President. I would agree with you. I mean, this is, uh, uh, it's really not all it's, it's cracked up to be. And I mean, it should be noted that this, this wasn't a well thought out legislative solution uh, from Congress. This was a, a unilateral stroke of the pen from the president. Um, so I, I mean, as, as we can see, it, it seems fairly half baked. And uh, given the fact that we don't see really any uh, great relief uh, in the early months of next year, um, you know, I, I, you know, it, it's being paid back. I think folks will continue to be struggling at that point. Council Member Chavez. Yeah, um, just a couple points for clarification from um, our, our staff. So from what I understand, um, this, this, this was obviously an executive order um, by the president to provide um, some uh, relief uh, for this year. And, and I absolutely agree next year, I think the way it's structured, it'll be have to paid back, but um, the question I'm trying to get answered to is, does each individual employee um, opt out or opt in into this um, uh, clause, so to speak? Council Member Chavez, um, I, the, the, the way that it works is by the employer. So whatever decision the, the city makes is the decision that the employees are bound by. Um, so for example, if the city opts in, individual employees cannot opt out and vice versa. Does that answer your question? So, uh, so why not l just let the employee um, either opt out of this? Because I, I think there's some benefit to this for some folks now that can provide some immediate relief, um, understanding, of course, that 
early next year, you know, their their tax uh, liability will will change. But that might work out for some folks, depending on their individual financial um, situation. Right. Um, and so what I'm trying to understand is what how do we leave that flexible and leave it up to the employee so that if their situation, um, you know, warrants and they want it, they can still opt into it. Or um, if it doesn't, they can still opt out um, individually. So the executive order provides uh, the ability through the IRS uh, regulations that for the employer to make the decision for all employees. It does not provide for the employee to make the individual decision. So certainly you could, as, as uh, Councilmember Soria asked, something like survey the employees and decide what the majority want, do something along those lines, but it's kind of all or nothing from the employer perspective. Either the city opts in or it doesn't. Councilmember Chavez? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to follow up on, on that point because that was my question about did we even survey? Have When when did we know that we could ask our employees about this? Did uh, we just find out? The, the executive order um, uh, became, or the executive order rather was instituted uh, beginning September 1st, 2020. Our office was asked the inquiry several weeks ago. Um, we obviously did the research on it, put together the information then. Um, I'm not, I, I can't yeah, speak to I, when. Yeah, because I think if, if the employees don't have the ability to opt out, for me, it would have warranted that we do a survey. Mm. Um, but we should have done the survey when we found out about the program so that, you know, we're already on to October. The benefit would only really come to play probably by the time that we institute this. It wouldn't be until November, so maybe even November, December, two months. You is know. there a deadline for us to make a decision? None that's included in the executive order, no. Okay. Uh, Councilman Bredefe, you have the floor. So this would have been through, from September through the end of the year? That's mm -hmm. correct. Okay, so just looking at uh, a $50,000 salary, let's say, at 6.2%, from where we are, if it started October 1st, we're looking at about $119 a pay period. So that's 240 it's $500 for the remainder of the year that somebody could save at $50,000. Obviously, it's prorated depending. So that, that's not insignificant money. Um, now, I agree, it's, um, it's not all it's cracked up to be, only in the sense that it's, you don't know what the future holds. Now, I've heard the president, I don't know if it's accurate, say that um, if he's around come January, he's going to not require that payback. And that's what he said. So I don't know if, if uh, you know, he will be around to do that or not, but. So it, in some sense, it's a, it's a gamble, but it's it's not insignificant money. I don't want to just ignore the fact that somebody could be saving five hundred to a thousand dollars. Well, should we survey? Because I think I don't know what the time frame is to get a survey to make it beneficial for somebody. I mean, if we could do it quickly, I, I I think that's a wise idea. But I just don't know. Monkey if we have the survey. Time. Ask them one question. I think um, <laughs> allow me to identify our personnel director. Do you have anything to add about where the labor partners stand on this item? As he approaches council president, this is not a voting item, correct? Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. It is. Thanks. It, well, well, you know what, what this reminds me of is uh, last year, um, it was one of council member Brandbell's exiting items that, that we, uh, that went down in flames. Um, it was the, an item he brought forth and it, it was through a private company, not through the federal government where we were going to bring in sort of a, a private lender for our, a private predatory lender for our employees, right? And, um, you know, th th this conversation reminds me of that conversation. I see some parallels there. And I think that the council uh, pretty soundly rejected that, uh, that proposal. So I, I, I'd kind of just encourage us to kind of think back to what some of the pros and cons were when we, when we discussed uh, that and see if it applies here. Okay. Um, Director Conrad, you may approach. And it would be helpful if you have a recommendation from the staff on this. Sure. Jeff Cardell, Director of Personnel Services. Um, we have not heard of any interest from the bargaining units, but what we could do is we could provide notice, as we typically do on a, any number of different issues that are relative to terms and conditions of employment, and uh, give them the opportunity to let us know whether or not there is, in fact, interest for any of their members, um, and if they want to proceed as a bargaining unit. Uh, what's the time frame to get that information? Back? We, we, um, 
We typically give them two weeks to respond, but given the, the timing of this, we could say, please let us know within a week's time. And then it would be up to them to, to let us know, yes, mm -hmm. they'd like to pursue or no, they wouldn't. Could we know by next, next council meeting, get some feedback? And then I think we can make an informed decision. Because I, I don't want to just ignore somebody being able to save $500. We, we can certainly make the request and whatever information is provided to us, we can provide to you. Sounds like a fair path forward. So with that, I'll make a motion to table this item to next week. Is there a second? Second. second. All right. So we'll and, make sure that it's and I, on the... I, I, I would note that, um, again, that item from last year and just sort of informal conversations with the bargaining units, I, I didn't identify any who were in favor of that one. Um, so again, if, if there are enough parallels, probably that might give some indication of where they might land, but certainly worth uh, talking to them about Be the respective characteristics of this program. Thank you. Before we go for a vote, any member of the public wishing to, oh, actually there's no public comment on this or discussion, so roll call, please. Councilmember Bredefeld? Yes. Councilmember Chaka? Yes. Councilmember Esparza? Aye. Councilmember Fabasi? Councilmember Soria? Yes. Council Vice President Capriolio? Yes. And President Arias? Yes. With that, Council, we'll return to item 2BB, the uh, proposal to fund the Fresno Arts and Culture Emergency Grant. Councilman, you have the floor. Councilmember Bredefield pulled it. He had some questions. I was asking uh, questions in terms of the institution, how they're, you know, art and culture institutions, the art uh, programs, each are going to be awarded different amounts. How are we defining those uh, different terms? Um, and also, um, the, the Fresno Arts Council uh, will be determining these awards. I mean, this is not insignificant, obviously, $1.5 million, a lot of money, uh, awarding ten to $150,000 to institutions that are not well defined, ten to twenty-five thousand dollars to art programs is not well defined. I, I mean, this seems potentially rife with people who can call themselves a program um, without being an actual program. I mean, I want to help people who truly have been impacted. I'm just concerned how we define all of this, how this is uh, determined, and really is the Fresno Arts Council the best arbiter of determining where these monies go. That's not their role as a Fresno Arts Council. So, so the, the Fresno Arts, we believe that the Fresno Arts Council is the most appropriate vehicle because they actually have the partnerships across the city with everyone that is connected to arts and culture. And so they already have been awarded a couple thousand dollars for some private relief that they were in, they instituted, I think, back in August. Uh, but it was a very small amount that they were given by like private foundations. So this would augment to be able to help. So they've already established a program. Um, the Fresno Arts Council with our direction would um, end up setting the criteria for the funding levels. We just kind of put a maximum scale. In our community, we have places like the Tower Theater, um, Second Space, Roger Rockus, which have been 100% closed mm -hmm. this entire time. And I've had many conversations with them where they have received no income. They couldn't even benefit from PPP because they couldn't put their employees to work because they were 100% closed. They are at the verge of not being able to open up at all. And I would hate for this city to lose it's arts and culture because it provides a value to our economy. So we will be developing the criteria. This is to authorize and um, locate the money. If you want to be part of it, Council Member Carbossi and I are working, have been working on this. The subcommittee supported us moving forward because they understand the value in, in sure. making sure that these folks get um, some sort of relief. It's not going to solve the entire problem, but it's going to mitigate some of those issues. If you want to join the efforts to be able to develop you know the specific criteria we're happy to include you um, but I think it gives you a general idea of the three different types right. of grants um, and the levels for the grants no I, I'm, com so. I'm comfortable with what you're saying and there's going to be oversight it's it's not clear in here right. about the level of oversight and its definitions but I, I hear what you're saying that makes it more comfortable as, aside from uh, both of you is there 
uh, administration that will be overseeing these awards? Yes, finance is working with us, um, okay. and then also through the subcommittee. So there right. is a lot of oversight that will be Fantastic, I'm, I'm comfortable with Assistant that. city manager. It's not on, it's not on. Okay, it, you, your mic wasn't on. Okay. What, what he's saying is, um, when we bring the actual contract forward with the Art Council, I have the criteria in the contract, so everything yeah, will be fleshed out. I flagged there that yesterday, go. and I, I think we can develop some criteria with the Art Council that would say how much is awarded based on that criteria. Okay. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good. Fantastic. No, and, and I appreciate that question, Councilman. Mm -hmm. um, fiscal oversight is something important to both you and I. So we have another item on here for nonprofits. That's going to be in administered internally. And I've told you, and we've said before that government isn't the answer to everything. We have to partner with people. And with being arts, I'm not an expert in art. I wish I was. I know rugs. That's about it. <laughs> so um, I think it's a great partnership we're going to have. And, and like Councilman Rosori has said, um, you know, my family is a small business. I hope we're going to survive. A lot of businesses, we've tried helping them with the small business grants. I think we're going to help them survive the Parklet program. Some may not. When you lose the Philharmonic, I spoke with the Philharmonic uh, director yesterday. When you lose those organizations, they don't come back. The, you know, businesses will come back, hopefully. But when you lose that, it's really hard to build that again. And we don't want to lose our culture uh, as a result of COVID. So I, I really appreciate uh, your support on this. And Council Member uh, Bradfield, it's listed as myself, Member Chavez, and Soria, just because we recommended the appropriations. But the details are being uh, developed by Council Member Carbasi and Soria. Excellent. I think. Uh City Attorney wants to weigh in. Council just wanted to clarify that um, pursuant to the resolution, um, city staff is directed to work with the Arts Council, so the administration can work with the Arts Council to develop um, more detailed criteria. Okay, good enough. All right. And the contract is on for today. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Oh, I'll second. second. All right, um, let me go to the public. Anybody in public wishing to address this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back for a, a vote. The roll call, please. Council Member Bredefeld? Yes. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Carbasi? Yes. Council Member Soria? Yes. Council Vice President Caprioli? Yes. And President Arias? Yes. And thank you, Council. We're taking one more step in trying to make sure that we have some level and presence of arts and culture so that when we re all re exit the pandemic, um, we can get back to theaters performances, kids playing music, and entertainment being done safely. With that, Council, we'll go to the next item, 2CC. It was pulled by Member um, Bradfield. Yeah, and it's it, it's this similar just kind of things uh, in terms of looking at related to nonprofits. What is, what is the grant criteria for an award? It, it really doesn't say. Um, and I'm just concerned about how we're, you know, which nonprofits are going to uh, get awarded money. There's a lot of them out there. Um, how do they uh, prove that they've actually been hurt by COVID-19? So again, the, the idea is a good one. I'm just concerned about the potential for abuse without very clear criteria and definition. So um, this nonprofit emergency relief grant is gonna be administered by our economic development division here mm -hmm. internally. So similar to what we did with the small business grant, um, there will be a set criteria depending on the level of funding up to 20,000 that they can get. Um, but essentially, um, we are looking to help those nonprofits that haven't received really any assistance. Um, this was really spurred from, I got a call from the VFW um, 89, post 8900 out of Blythe in my district. Um, so the veterans in this area rely on their dinners and parties to raise money to help the local veterans and provide resources. And so what they've told me is that they're in fear that they're gonna lose their, their building because they can't afford to pay PG&E, they can't afford to pay their rent, they can't afford to pay anything because they have not been able to do any fundraising like they used to do to support just their operations. Those are the types of nonprofits that I'm interested in helping. Those that have not received any help, they, they didn't qualify for any PPP or any other sort of source of relief. Um, and that's what we're trying to do to help those organizations that are at the verge of pretty much not being able to service our seniors, our, not, our veterans, our 
disabled children that are out there without any resources. And, and I fully support that and fully support them. It's just without the def definition, it's fraught for other nonprofits putting in. As soon as the people hear that there's half a million dollars out there that the city's handing out, they're gonna be banging at the door. And so I wanna help those nonprofits that you just outlined, absolutely, and especially with veterans groups. But we have to be concerned about people who are not really impacted, who hear there's free money at the city of Fresno, all you gotta do is apply. Yeah, and so well, we're working with the administration, so Lupus Division, um, which has been doing the small, or did a part of the small business program, is gonna be helping um, ensure that, you know, we have the developed criteria that won't, um, will narrow, really. Okay. Yeah, we had the cool. same issue, Councilman Bredefeld, when we put out the Save Our Small Business Grants. And what ended up happening was the Small Business Grant Subcommittee worked with the administration and realized, how do we whittle this down to affect those most impacted? Because a lot of, we talked about the arts and a lot of these nonprofits, some of them are still closed. And as great as PPP is, it's dried up. And of course, Washington hasn't gotten their act together and got more relief to us. So um, we have to do something to stop the hemorrhaging, and that's the attempt. So the, the subcommittee will come up with those recommendations, and we're going to be pretty strict, I can promise you that. Okay. As long as you didn't uh, go to a council member's house and cause commotion, your nonprofit will qualify. Absolutely. And I, I, I think, council member, it's fair to say that if, if you're a cannabis nonprofit, you're probably not going to get awarded. If you're a veterans nonprofit, you're probably going to get awarded. Well, I'm glad we've made that distinction. Yeah, let's, let's be clear. <laughs> so, uh, member Bredefeld, do not have your nonprofit submit. I will not. I don't know of many, but anyway. <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, I'll make a motion to approve the item. Let me go to the public. Right. Is there any member of the public wishing to address this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back for a roll call. Council Member Bredefeld? Yes. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Carbasi? Yes. Council Member Soria? Yes. Council Vice President Caprielio? Yes. Council President Arias? Yes. Next item is 211 uh, from Council Member Bredefield. He pulled that item. Yes. Um, did you want to address this, uh, Council Member Soria, or do you want me to just address other concerns I have regarding this? Excuse me. Thank you. Um, so this resolution is a pretty simple resolution. It's directing to so that the city review the names of all city facilities and prohibiting name, naming of city of Fresno assets after cultural historic figures known to be racist or bigoted. Um, we've had an opportunity to talk um, with the chair of the city of Fresno's historic preservation commission. Previous to today, or if we look at today, we don't have a process of review for the naming of public facilities. And so what we wanted to do is create a process that would allow um, one, the historic preservation, to review any future naming of public facilities and then give a recommendation to the council. Obviously, the council would have to make the final determination of the naming, but that way we would have some experts in our community when it comes to history to make final recommendations. Uh, the historic preservation chair is supportive of the process. Um, the chair also stated to us that the process and policy is followed by other cities through landmarks and commissions in cities such as Los Angeles, Asheville, North Carolina, Oklahoma City in Oklahoma, and so forth. So those are just some examples of cities. Um, the resolution today essentially asks our historic preservation to review all currently named facilities or assets, noting all names related to racism and bigotry in all, all forms and that the commission will comply with report of their findings to um, us, and then we can make a final determination. And for any future um, public namings, as I said, and um, that's pretty much it. Hey, uh, a couple years ago, city attorney, we had, this, it was a naming of uh, somebody on the convention center. Is there a city policy that, that governs naming of streets or facilities? In the municipal code, it says that there's a process and ultimately the council makes that decision. Is this, is this consistent with that? It would be consistent with that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, council president. Go ahead, just member a, Chavez. Just a quick, quick question. Um, I'm supportive of going forward with this, but I, I, I wanna be very thoughtful um, about how, about the criteria on how the historical um, society 
will determine somebody that no, you know was racist or or yeah. or a bigot. Yeah. Was there a guideline or criteria that other cities followed in determining that, or is that something that they're going to be um, uh, essentially uh, building the framework for? The, the commission will be building the framework. I didn't set any criteria in this because I believe that it should be developed as part of the process. And then ultimately, this council has um, the ultimate power and discretion as to moving forward or not with any recommendations. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah so, so here, here lies the problem for me. I understand the intent, um, but what we're doing is bringing the cancel culture uh, to our city. I mean, that's the potential for this, and it's a very slippery slope. Uh, we're asking the Historic Preservation Commission to one, label and define what racism is and what being bigoted is, and then come back to us. The city's Hist Historic Preservation Commission is comprised of seven individuals uh, appointed by the mayor who have training and expertise in preservation, architecture, architectural history, engineering, and related fields. I don't know what we're... Uh, uh, tasking them with determining racism and being bigoted. Um, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And if we're looking at um, canceling people based on what is labeled being a racist or a bigot, um, we have just been briefly looking at some of the uh, assets that the city owns, because this relates to city assets. One of them is the Mukes home. And I guess uh, the Muke's name would have to be changed um, because in looking up uh, the owner, Dr. Muke's, uh, he served in the Confederate Army in 1861. He was on the wrong side of history. He was uh, defending slavery. And he was also a physician who came to Fresno and served the citizens of Fresno for two decades, helping them. But if we go down this road, the Muke's home would have to be renamed because that's a city asset and I would think he defines what we're talking about here if you're, we're defending slavery and went to war over slavery. So where do we draw these lines? Uh, there are people in our country who want to rename uh, anything related to George Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson, because they own slaves. They participated in that abhorrent, evil practice of slavery. And we have city assets named after Washington and Jefferson. We have streets. And I've asked the city attorney, are streets city assets? They are city assets, are they not? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're city assets. So where does this go? Um, I just think this is divisive. Uh, I don't think this is bringing us together. Again, I understand the intent, but this doesn't help. This, this leads us to, to what they call cancel culture. Um, we need to seek out policies that hurt people in terms of opportunity, and we need to change those policies fully in favor of that. Um, you know, we live in a world where if you disagree with people politically, unfortunately, uh, it's quick to call somebody a racist, uh, a bigot, um, a white supremacist. Uh, you know, three years ago, I spoke out against uh, the NFL and people kneeling. I didn't agree with it, don't agree with it today. And we had people come in here and call me a racist, the devil, glad you took off your hood. Uh, I remember those things from three years ago. And I guess people could come in here and say, hey, what he said was racist. And his name's on the memorial, on, on a plaque at uh, Chichancy Park. We got to take it off. His name is on a plaque at the exhibit hall helping get that bill. His name's right out there in the Fresno Veterans Memorial. He led the effort to honor our veterans of all different creeds and religions and colors. But we can't have that. We disagree with what he said. And yet I defended, by the way, the NFL to kneel. That's the greatness of our country. They have the right to do that. So this is a slippery slope. It's one I don't agree with. I think the council would be very wise to just say, this is not the right way to go. And we're all against racism. We all fight against it. We do it every day up here when we talk about policy. We talked about it today with, with what's happened in uh, Southwest Fresno, how people have been ignored. And we came up with solutions. 
and I think very good solutions and very good policies, which I support it. And that's what we ought to be doing, fighting to improve our community. This is divisive. And so for that reason, I'm not going to support it. Thank you, Council Member. If, if I may just um, add a few words. You know, the, in God we trust behind us, for some people in this city, it, that was divisive. I recall the chamber being full. Half the folks wanted it, the other half didn't want it. And yet it went up there in a city asset and the world didn't end. I think it's time for us to begin these conversations and the Mute's home sits in my district. If history and the record demonstrates that it doesn't reflect the value of our city, then we should reconsider the naming of, of that museum. I think it's, you know, it's okay to um, study the history. I think we have a responsibility to wrestle with the truth. And the truth is, this city was built um, on the backs of certain people and at the expense of people and for the benefit of other people. And the truth is, this city has racist historical elements as part of its fabric, whether it's Fresno City College or folks who not only fought on the wrong side of history, but fought to continue to enslave generations of folks. And I think it's time for us not to run away from that, but to actually embrace it. And um, I, I'm, I'm not afraid of the process. I think Fresno has demonstrated, whether it's Black Lives Matters or the reopening or the Freedom Rally, that Fresnans can engage in public discourse, can have difference of opinion, and our city doesn't burn. But I think that's partly because we're willing to engage in those conversations in a civil way. And personally, I'm not scared of allowing the truth to surface and allowing today's presidents to wrestle with the fact that the Mukes House has a, you know, history that I'm surely not proud of, and maybe many of the people are not going to be either. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, in my view, giving the historic preservation group something more substantive than just looking at the colors of, you know, the exterior walls of a building. And um, if, if that means we all got to wrestle and learn about our history, so be it. But I'm fully reassured that just the way we overcame the divisiveness of those words, we will overcome any future discourse um, that forces us to wrestle with differences of opinion, of lived exp experiences, of values, and of religion. And um, I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not afraid of it. I welcome it. Um, the only thing that I was going to um, just mention also, this council, also the city of Fresno in the last, um, I think, maybe three, four years, we took a, a strong stance that we would not never um, have the Confederate flag. And so this is no different than making a recognition that we understand the value and the signaling that happens when you name a building after individuals and we want to be proud of naming buildings after people that mean something positive in our community and i think that this is this is what it is you know you you may um not agree with you know the folks that may be on the on the historic preservation committee actually i got an opportunity to appoint someone for my district that i recommended to the mayor and he appointed actually was on today's agenda you guys voted for him and these individuals get trained, not just, th they don't just get the background that you mentioned, they actually get trained in historic preservation and history and so forth and in how to go about a process. And I'm not afraid either. I think that it is important for us to learn and to understand and acknowledge and be able to, if need, need to, to change things. I think that that's our responsibility as leaders. I believe that that is leadership. I know that you may say, oh, this is, we shouldn't be engaging in this cancel culture. It's not about engaging in cancel culture. It's about recognizing, um, yes, we, didn't, we weren't the ones that you know, created that history, but I think that it is our opportunity to acknowledge it and to rectify because there's still a lot of um, hurt in communities that live in our, in our community. 
you know, just even on the Armenian issue, right? We, we stood up as a council together supporting our Armenian community on an issue that is not here local. Why can't we stand up for folks in our community that may be feeling that some of the buildings or some of the facilities across our city, maybe not just ours, but, you know, Fresno City College, that they shouldn't be named after certain individuals because of the history. And this is our opportunity to stand up and develop a process so that we do have those conversations and allow the process to play out. And, and I appreciate, go ahead, I'm sorry. Did someone else want to go? Yeah, no, uh, Council President, sure. I, I, I just want to make sure that, um, you know, and I agree with what everybody said, I, I just want to make sure that we take a, a humanistic approach to whatever the criteria is that's going to be developed, because as we all know, um, nobody, you know, is perfect, mm -hmm. right? A a every human being has flaws, um, and, and, and I don't want this to be the opportunity where we're just evaluating somebody on something they said, and I say that because, you know, I have personal friends that used to be part of organizations that were um, racist, um, and, and now they're not. And, and so part of that equation is that every human being um, has a very different life experience. Um, they, you know, refuted that now. Um, and, and, and we don't know people's individual stories, but I also believe, believe in redemption. And that's actually how we're going to transcend a lot of these race relation issues that we have in our community, where we take these opportunities, oftentimes with people that we don't agree with, um, that we don't see eye to eye on, but at the end of the day, we're all human beings. And so I just want to make sure that the process is clear, holistic, comprehensive, and that it looks at the individual because, you know, we're using the, the Mukes home. You know, he was a Confederate doctor. Um, did he come to Fresno um, and then serve, you know, disadvantaged communities uh, for free? That's something that, you know, should be also factored into what that means for our community. Right. I, I've never seen a piece of legislation or policy change the heart of a human being. That only happens through honest conversations, very blunt and open dialogue. Uh, and hopefully at the end of the day, agreeing that we're all human beings. Nobody's perfect. Um, and, you know, we got to keep moving forward as a community. And so my hope is, is only that we come up with that comprehensive, holistic approach of what you know, these individuals, who they were, but more importantly, who they became, because, you know, we have those words written up there and God we trust, you know, part of religion teaches you about redemption and how you can change and evolve as a human being. And so we have to be cognizant and, and just take that human approach to what we do here today. Thank you. Councilor Bradfield, you have, I think, the final word and then we'll go for a vote. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate your comments, uh, Council Member Chavez, because it's, it's exactly right. None of us, uh, are perfect. Nobody who's walked this planet, other than one individual in my opinion, was perfect. And um, I also believe we should study history. I, I am completely in agreement. Our history is very relevant. My concern is that we, we are canceling our history. We want to ig ignore it, um, not study it. So we should study it because our history has been painful and it has many uh, um, uh, terrible things that occurred in it at the same time. Uh, the history also demonstrates that we're a great country that has continued to evolve and uh, are the greatest nation on earth. That's why everybody wants to come here. And, uh, you know, uh, without going too deep, I mean, we, we fought a war to end uh, that abhorrent uh, slavery. But having said that, we don't want to uh, uh, cancel history. We do want to look at it. We want to study it. Uh, we want to value it. Uh, I'm in agreement. We, th this council uh, said the Confederate flag will not fly there. I support that. Um, that's, but that to me is not canceling history. That's understanding it and being sensitive to it, not canceling it. And I fully su support those kinds of things. So we're going to differ on this. And again, this is no slam on members of the Historic Preservation Commission. I just don't think we should be punting something as uh, really challenging and difficult um, if this council wants to take it up, they should take it up. I don't think, you know, a, a body that's designed to look at architecture and architectural history uh, should be the one doing that. But that's said, a fair I, point. I Council Mayor Bredefield, uh, Carbasi. 
just to clarify once again, we have the final say, correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, to Luis Chavez, I think you landed this one for me, so thank you with your comments. I really do appreciate yeah. them. No, seriously, that, that really expresses my sentiments, Luis. Thank you. With motion that council, to. Uh, there's a motion to approve. All second. Sec second by Councilmember Chavez. Let me go to the public. Any member of the public wishing to address this resolution? I see a few of them. Can you show me the attendees? There we go. Um, we'll go to 644 number first. Please identify yourself. 644. Let's move on to Gary Hutt. Gary? Here. Hey, thank you for uh, taking my call. But just a brief synopsis of history. I'm an African American major in history. And I think what you fail to realize, Brother Phil, and the others who speak up, yeah, no one's perfect, but we've been endured under this rule of punishment for over 500 years. What you fail to realize, you don't wear my skin. You don't go to the stores where I shop, and maybe you do. You don't feel what I feel when I get looked at. When I'm being patrolled by a police officer, you don't feel that pain that I feel. I'm college educated, but yet still, I still have a fear of certain white people, certain white men. In places where I go, I still, look, I still get looked at suspiciously because of the color of my skin. Neither of you on the campus, uh, on, on, the, on the calendar, don't have that effect that I have. So for you to say that no one's perfect, you can dominate, rape, pillage, mutilate, for 500 years, a group of people, and they still have to endure your pain and your punishment this day and age. Because you don't have the pigmentation that I have, it's easy for you to say, well, not everyone's perfect, but we have to endure some of the things. This person that you guys are talking about, we can even go back to George Washington. For them to be in the positions that they were in gave them the authority over people to subdue them and treat them as animals. That has not changed. Now, history on police. Police did not exist prior to slavery. Police came about because of the overseer who became an officer. When a slave escaped the brutality of slavery, when the master told the officer or the overseer to go after that slave, bring him back to the property, blow his brains out, and drag him down the road so the other slaves did not get an idea of escape. That analogy is culturized within the police around this country. Nothing's changed. Now, if you want to speak about genocides, we have over 250 million Africans who have died at the hands of slavery, and that's a small number. The second feature Thank you, is- Thank you, Gary. Can I just finish one last yes, point? Yes, please conclude. So what you're saying, Miguel, is, and I, and I say this about changing names. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with changing the name when the foundation is rotten. If you have a, a railroad track and you run new tracks over it, Okay, it, it, you, can, you can erase that part. It's not erasing history, it's cleaning up its history. It's making people whole who have suffered under the hands of a bad history. History doesn't go away, it's the mindset. Thank you. So let's get that straight. There's no erasing history. Thank you. It's, it's giving people a chance to hear. Next person is Lisa Flores. Do you have a minute? Um, good afternoon. Real quick. Fresno has a historical and systematic issue with racism in the community. Um, it's simple as the redlining of the African-American community in this town. And the big question is, how do you acknowledge it? How do you define it? And how do you seek re reconciliation? And your first step is to define what is racism in this city? What is the standard? And then you can go forward and seek reconciliation. And reconciliation is actually a very positive thing for the community because when you take care of these landmarks that may be racist or maybe not be racist, let's look at them. What you're doing is that you're expanding your history. You're expanding your history to, for inclusion. You're expanding your history of inclusion of African American, Native Americans, the Hmong community, your, your Armenians. You're expanding the history and the accept and you're expanding community standards. So I look at this as a positive. Define it and let's move on. Thank you, Lisa. Next person is Brandy. Brandy. Can you hear me? Yes, proceed. Okay, sorry, I've never done this on the phone. Um, I just simply want to thank you guys for engaging this process for the Historic Preservation uh, Committee to engage in this. Um, 
particularly want to uh, thank, uh, acknowledge the, the comments that you made, uh, uh, obvious, um, that pretty much expressed what I was I would have expressed. So thank you guys very much. I support this. Thank you. We'll bring it back we'll to the back. council. No. Roll call, please. Council Member Bredefeld? No. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Carbasi? Council Member Soria? Yes. Council Vice President Capriolio? President Arias? Yes. Thank you, Council. The next item is 2EE. I just confirmed with the member who pulled it, Member Carbasi, that he doesn't have any concerns anymore. So I'm just going to ask for a motion to approve. Motion by Member Bredefield, second by Member Soria. Anybody in the public wishing to speak to item 2EE? Seeing none, we'll bring it back for roll call, please. Council Member Bredefield? Yes. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Carbasi? Council Member Soria? Yes. Council Member, excuse me, Council Vice President Capriolio? President Arias? Yes. Council, we'll move on to a 1030 joint meeting in the Fresno Joint Powers Financing Authority, whose membership is Mayor Lee Brand, myself, and Councilwoman Soria. Well, there's two separate items related to the animal, um, to the financing. One is the um, related to the animal control shelter. Uh, Council, we do have to vote on these two separate actions separately. Um, so if, with that, I'm going to make a motion to approve the first item. Is there a second? Second. Yeah, let me go to the public. Any member of the public wishing to address this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. Roll call, please. Council Member Bredefeld? Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Carbasi? Council Member Soria? Yes. Council Vice President Capriolio? President Arias? Yes. The next item is number two. Yes, there were five votes. Um, we will make a motion to approve the second item related to the animal shelter. Is there a second? Let me go to the public. Any member of the public wishing to address the council on this item? The Seeing joint none. authority doesn't have to take a vote? Yes. Got it. Okay. We'll come back. Just the authority. Uh, there's a motion by me, seconded by Member Soria. Uh, let's do a roll call. Um, with Member Soria, myself, and Member uh, Lee Brand. Mayor Brand? Council Member Soria? Yes. And President Arias? Yes. All right, staff and Mayor, you have the full resources to build a state-of-the-art animal shelter, get our dogs and kitties back into a place where they're not killed on a daily basis. Instead, they're saved and put back in our streets safely. So congratulations, Mayor. I know it's been a big, big issue. Um, for any of you guys who have ever walked precincts and walked up to a door and seen cats and dogs, dog food out, you know that when they're an animal lover, they're a high propensity voter and they have an earful to give you about the needs of our animals and our companions. So thank you, Mayor, for the amount of work that this took. Council President, I just say this, I uh, congratulate the Council for their support and the subcommittee with Bredefeld and uh, Councilmember Soria. This will be a first-class facility, and it'll be with our goal is eventually it's going to get to a no-kill. Would be a major departure from many, many years of what we went through. So thank you. I'll, I'll be gone by then, but <laughs> there will be a groundbreaking here shortly. Th yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Our dogs, cats, and all the other companions we have will appreciate you for years to come. Uh, Assistant City Manager Shad. were involved in making this happen. They did a significant amount of work to not only get the bonding in place, but also the uh, property acquired and the design of the shelter in place. We got a long way to go, but uh, a lot of good work by staff. Thank you. We'll see you at the groundbreaking, hopefully with your pets. Um, so. And let, let me just also, let's acknowledge the gap because, um, you know, it's on their site and they do donated the land. And so we're very grateful to them as well. I do want to thank Member uh, Bradfield for uh, helping uh, encourage that donation. So um, there's nothing like a corporate partner, especially one that um, responds when they're encouraged, strongly encouraged. Thank you.
Yes, and to um, uh, our philanthropist, uh, Mr. Ed Cashin and Sal Gonzalez, who also help with the gap getting us the property, which is the right place in the right location at the right time um, to be a state of the art facility. All right, thank you, Mayor. I think you're off the hook in the dais unless you want to hang out and um, listen to our next presentation, which is a council workshop. Um, you are welcome to remain on the Office of Independent independent review. I think our auditor who has made some headlines recently is looking forward to giving us a full presentation and an overview of his role um, and where we stand as a city. So Mr. Auditor, um, it's been a while since I've seen you. I think probably a year since the last time we had a face-to-face -face prior to the pandemic. Um, so you have the floor and we'll leave it up to you for now. Thank you. Uh Council President, Council Members, uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you. And I've already recognized that you're way behind schedule, so I am doing my best to condense an hour plus presentation to 10 minutes or under. So I may leapfrog over some of the material in the PowerPoint, but uh, at the end, believe me, I'm open to any questions. Uh, uh, first slide, please, next. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'm gonna have to do it all by memory who we are. When I say we, it's myself and my community coordinator, Myra Aguilar, who's sitting behind me. And basically, the Office of Independent Review was put together to monitor complaints, concerns regarding Fresno Police Department. And I should point out that it's, everyone automatically thinks it's someone who's carrying a gun, uh, a sworn officer, but anyone who's employed by the Fresno Police Department, non-sworn, uh, not to single them out, a records clerk, uh, a dispatcher, a 911 operator, they're all uh, susceptible to having a complaint or concern lodged against them. So our role or my role is to ensure that when the complaints or concerns are reviewed by the police department internally by internal affairs, they're done in a thorough, fair, and uh, uh, extensive manner in which they rely on all the evidence that's at hand. And the goal of the unit is to ensure trust and transparency with the community. Uh, next, please. And when this unit was initially created back in 2009, uh, it had some, several evolutions. And then when Mayor Brand came on board and was elected, he made some significant changes. Prior to uh, his arrival, this was a part-time position. And when he came on board, it was uh, converted to full-time because previously it was part-time served by people actually out of state serving at part-time. Uh, and the person must reside in the city of Fresno, which I do. And one of the big changes was responding to officer-involved shootings, and that's on a 24-7 basis. So I have been available to, I'd probably say, 85 to 90% of the officer-involved shootings, and that's 24-7. So my first one was at 5 a.m. on New Year's Day, uh, and I responded to that. And the, the, one of the uh, advantages of actually responding to the shootings, some of the people aren't aware of the fact that post-shooting, they then afford me the opportunity to monitor the interviews of the officers or witnesses. And during that, they will then take a break and come out and allow me to interject questions if I feel they didn't ask a question. But I will say, I have yet to monitor an interview where they left something uh, unaddressed. So they've done a great job of that. And then post officer involved shootings, they also have debriefings. Those usually held within five days after a shooting. And the purpose of that, it's not to evaluate whether it was within policy shoot or out of policy shoot, it's to evaluate the tactics, the training, and equipment. And my background is a former FBI SWAT operator, tactical instructor, firearms instructor. So you're evaluating, did they have the right equipment? Did they exercise the proper tactics? Uh, did they, are they getting adequate training? So that's the purpose of that. So that's the first time the independent reviewer has been afforded uh, attendance to uh, an OIS debriefing. And then I also speak, uh, Myra and I both speak to the newly sworn officers. And these are the officers that are going through orientation. Prior to them hitting the street, we speak to the officers. And one of the perks of doing that, or the advantages of doing that, we relay to the new officers before they go out there and ride patrol what the community is asking of the police officers. So it's been very beneficial. So hopefully from day one, they know what the community is expecting from the officers. And then we also do ride-alongs. Uh, and we try and do them in each district. Uh, it was 
uh, beneficial pre-COVID, but with COVID, it's kind of postponed our ride-alongs. And one of the big changes also is meet monthly with uh, FPOA, your Fresno Police Officers Association. And Myra, I will point out, is bilingual. So uh, when we meet with the community, she's very helpful when you're dealing with the Hispanic community, uh, dealing with the different organizations. Uh, next, please. And the complaints regarding sworn or non-sworn are received in several different ways. Sometimes the police department themselves initiates their, their complaints against their own personnel. And I will point out that uh, contrary to popular belief, the police department initiates more complaints against their personnel than the community lodges against the personnel. And normally it runs two to one, but this last quarter, my report was just put out uh, two days ago, you will see that for the third quarter of 2020, it's three to one. The department initiated three times as many complaints against the personnel than the community lodged against the personnel. And Honor, once can you pause for sure. a minute? You're suggesting that the police um, initiates investigations against police officers at a three time higher rate than the public initiating the complaint? Yes. What would trigger an internal investigation? What type of things are you know, investigated that are initiated by the police department? Well, sometimes when they, for example, they'll monitor the body cam. They may see something on body cam just during a normal check, because they spot check body cam, even if a complaint's not lodged. They've identified officers misbehaving, uh, uh, conduct unbecoming, et cetera. Uh, and sometimes if an officer is, unfortunately, comes in contact with another department out of town, the department initiates that. And I will say this as far as disciplinary imposed, the most significant disciplinary imposed on officers or employees is based on department generated internal complaints versus community complaints. What, what type of, um, of, of those that are internally generated, how, what's the percentage of them that result in um, discipline or termination? I don't, I don't wanna speculate, I have to go back and look, but I also print in my reports the discipline by quarter so you will see termination, suspensions, uh, fines in lieu of if they lost equipment. That's another reason it's internal. If an officer loses a piece of equipment, whether or not it's simply keys, uh, they've lost weapons, that's an internally generated complaint against the personnel. When somebody is quote unquote tapped on the shoulder and is transferred to a department or demoted to a different um, assignment based on their performance, um, is that tracked internally by anyone? If they're demoted, that is tracked. If they're reassigned, it's tracked by internally by the Fresno PD personnel, but it's not tracked with internal affairs. So if an officer is transferred based on performance or misconduct, is that tracked anywhere in the system? In the police, with, internally within the, the personnel department, within the, the uh, Police Department, yes, but not w within internal affairs. Understood. Demotions are tracked, and I have noted demotions. If they're a, a sergeant in training, sometimes mm -hmm. they've been demoted back down to a patrol um, officer. Do, do your reports publish the amount of officers transferred or um, disciplined, the amount of officers disciplined? Disciplined as far as uh, termination, suspensions, uh, fines in lieu of. Uh, letters of, they're, they're called letter of intent or mm -hmm. a letter of a reprimand. Those are all things that I see. And my last question, when, when an officer is terminated or released from employment, um, what does a, what's the city's position when an, a future employer um, does a reference check? Do we um, release the information that was um, the reason for their release or termination? Well, there's a new, uh, law 1421, which makes that information available to the respective uh, prospective new employer. So the, I believe by law under 1421, they have to make that available. So they just can't leapfrog from one department to another. Um, when was that law passed? Do you know? I believe it was, went into effect January 1, 2020. Do not quote me on it, right. but I believe that's when it went into effect. So um, wh when you reference make it available, um, that's different than uh, us actively providing it to the employer. Are we required to provide it or just make it available if the future employer requests it? Well, I don't know 
I'm not, like, hypothetically, I don't know an employer that would hire an officer coming from another department without checking why they left that department. We have a lot of small rural towns, and they're lucky just to get an officer when they struggle to compete with, you know, other organizations that are larger sizes. So, what, what um, you know, in education, we call that the dance of the lemons, right. where people leave, and it's not said why they leave. Um, and when they check for references, they just state the time and place of employment and, and tenure, and that's code for they didn't leave in good standing. What, what I'm trying to assess is, do we actively, like we would any other employee in any other industry, um, share with the future employer the conditions and work for which they left employment? I believe they would also have to check with POST, police officer standards and training, because they have to maintain certification so that it would show the records of where they were, were employed. Okay, thank you. So, so the, the, the complaints are generated one of, uh, one of several ways. It's either internally, it's by the community, and then once the complaint uh, comes on board, uh, it's then determined what level it's gonna be assigned, whether or not it's a full IA or something that is not g going to be a disciplinary action imposed. It's called an informal complaint or a simple uh, questioning policy, et cetera. It's called an inquiry. And uh, one thing I can say is even though it's an informal complaint, in the past those weren't reviewed by the Office of Independent Review, but I review every one of those even though they rarely result in any type of discipline. Uh, next slide, please. And here's what is reviewed by our office, which is essentially myself. All officer-involved shootings, all use of force, in-custody deaths, uh, bias complaints, and I say all other IA cases because in the past, it was selective on which IA cases were reviewed. I review all of them in which the officer was found not at fault by the department. So I review them to confirm did they make the right decision? Did they look at everything? Did they overlook anything? If they determine it's sustained, which is basically determining the officer or employee was at fault, I do not review those a second time. Auditor, can you pause really quick? So um, to your statement, if um, I'm an employee of officer here and I get in trouble and my internal affairs confirms that I did something wrong, you don't do any review to see whether the internal affairs department's um, conclusion or severity of the discipline was sufficient? I do not have authority or input on discipline, but f for what it's worth, I do review the cases which are sustained depending on the discipline because I want to see what the threshold they consider to be a terminating of type offense or a suspension type offense. So I don't review it for uh, inclusion into my reports, but I review it internally because you know, I have access to everything that they, they look at themselves. I log in as if I'm an F FPD employee. So is it fair to say that you review it for the purpose of getting um, you know, uh, like a, a flavor of what the department is defining to be severe enough for termination versus a slap in the hand. Correct, because down the road, if I review something w which the officer or employee is dealt severely, either a termination or suspension, and then uh, several weeks later, I see a similar type case, which is discipline is not the same, I try and figure out why is it different. That makes per perfect, thank you. So, so it's reassuring that you're, you're looking for to benchmark yourself against internal expectations and trying to identify trends. Right. Thank you. I want the process to be fair yeah, to everybody. You. Council President, uh, not to interrupt, uh, I have to make another Zoom call to the court because this my court process was scheduled before the hearings today. And uh, you might want to do a one-on-one -on -one since you're the only one that's at the dais. Uh, it might save time and energy for everyone. But before I go, uh, I would like to make a motion. Uh, that's the second part of our 2 o'clock item, which is 335. So I just want to note that we have paved in my district from Shields uh, to Bullard. Bullard is a boundary with a uh, member of uh, Bredefield's district. However, there's a patch that was not paved, and that was between Shaw and Barstow. So I'd make a motion to have Public Works uh, pave the area, finish the paving job between uh, Shaw and Barstow. 
I hope I have a second. Second. All right, the Thank Council you. Vice President made a budget motion because he needs to excuse himself. Uh, I'll be, uh, as soon as I'm finished, understood. you know how court and process then is. We'll now continue with the workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can go to the next one, please. These are the, uh, some of the things uh, I take into consideration when I'm reviewing these cases. And one, right out of the, uh, right out of the gate, I should uh, state that I wait for internal affairs to complete their investigation because I want to make sure my assessment is based on all the evidence at hand and I don't uh, make a determination without uh, reviewing all the evidence. Uh, in some of the time frames of the PD's IA investigations, if it's an office involved shootings, those sometimes take as much as a year. And so I will not start mine until they're completed. So it may take me uh, several more months after that. So that's why you see a delay in some of the reporting because I have to wait for the IA to complete their investigation. And there's a list of the items that I look at. And one thing I'll point out, because uh, I know some people have questioned the body cams. Body cam activation is mandatory. And even though you may not have a complaint lodged against you, it may be lodged against a two officers or an officer that was with you on a call, if you fail to activate your body cam, even though the complaint's not on you, they will reprimand the officer that fails to activate the body cam. There's very few exceptions or when they're not expected to activate their body cams. So uh, I won't go through all of those, so we can go to the next slide. And these are some of the other items that, that I look at. Uh, and one of the things I will say, the officer interviews, some of those officer interviews can take as much as three and four hours. So when I do my review, I know some of the public responds or makes an assessment based on a 20 second portion of either body cam or surveillance video from a business, et cetera. I don't go based solely on that. I look at everything. And so if there's several officers on scene, there may be 20 to 30 hours of just interviews alone. It doesn't even include all the body cam video. So uh, that's why it takes the, the review several weeks, if not a month on top of the IA in the investigation. And one of the things I should also uh, specify, my reviews are administrative, they're not criminal. So it criminal is left up to the district attorney's office and the United States Department of Justice. So I need to point that out. Next, please. These are the categories of my reports when I put them out. And these categories were not present in the previous reports. They were all lumped together. So we break them down as far as uh, officer involved shootings, including in custody deaths. And I also start including officer involved shootings regarding dogs. And I re actually review the officer involved shootings regarding uh, dogs. It's usually a dog, it's very seldom it's a different animal. Uh, un unreasonable force, bias, dis uh, discourteous conduct or conduct unbecoming, and administrative performance. Those are issues in which the officer may have violated policy and it's really not interacting with the public, it's an internal issue, and then vehicle uh, accidents. And these are the changes I've made to the reports to do my best to enhance transparency with the public where they weren't done before. I review all cases, like I said before, including informal complaints. And I do OIS mapping, which is officer involved shooting mapping, which shows you at a snapshot where all the shootings took place over the last five years in the city of Fresno. So you know, if you live in a certain part of town, is the police, are they shooting more people in my area than other parts of town? So you can see just by looking at the map and it's color coded by year so you know where each shooting took place. And also I began listing the complaints by policing districts. There's five policing districts. So you know the number of complaints are the same or close and you could see, don't quote, don't quote me on it, the numbers are there. They're similar across the board so you don't have a portion of town whether or not it's northeast, northwest, southeast, central that has more complaints than the other uh, portions. And then also, uh, in the past, they did not list in uh, council president, you asked about what happens when an officer leaves, et cetera. Sometimes in the past, if it's an officer or employee left before the internal investigation was completed, they would say suspend the case and it would drop off the books. I said, well, as far as transparency, if you're the complainant and you're trying to find out what's going on with your complaint and all of a sudden it's no longer on the books, you're wondering what happened to it. So I list that it's suspended. I cannot state why the employee is no longer with the department. It may be 
terminated or they may left on their own will, but they're just no longer with the uh, Fresno Police Department. And then I also list uh, all the uh, discipline across the board based on the categories. Uh, and in one category, respond to community questions or requests. While we're out speaking, we may have groups that may ask me a question or two that aren't really included in my reports. So I will go back and try and address that. And one of the things that came up, people had a different idea of what the Homeless Task Force was doing. So we met with Captain Burke at that time who was in charge of the Homeless Task Force. I did a segment on the Homeless Task Force. I know uh, Congress Member Bredefeld used it in one of his community uh, briefings that showed to the public what they're actually doing, how many people they come in contact are actually being arrested, how many are getting programs. Uh, and then finally, uh, the recommendations regardless of the findings, even if I agree with the police department as far as their actions on an investigation, I'm gonna make risk recommendations regarding their policy or procedure or training. And I've done that since I've been here 43 times and people will say, well, and even uh, Council President Iris, you raised this question, how do we know that they're actually listening to what you're saying or they're taking action? Out of the 43 recommendations I've made in the last three years, they have made changes to policy, procedure, training, or counseling with an officer or an employee over 88% of the time. So that's 37% that they've, 37 times. And what I do, so it shows the public, I'm just not taking their word for it, I print their responses verbatim in my following report, what they told me based on my recommendations, of what they need to do, what I felt should be changed. And one thing I'll point it out, because I know we're getting short on time, I'll probably wave you on my 10 minutes and I apologize. Right. The most recent case which created a lot of uproar, even though I went against the police department on that use of force case, and I made two recommendations, although the, the police department did not agree with my assessment, they still incorporated those two recommendations that I made based on policies that are coming out in the future. And I uh, obtained that directly from Chief Hall. Uh, oh, next. John, and those recommendations are tracked in your reports, right? Yes, for the yes. public to know. You will see in the supplemental report that came out, there's two recommendations towards at the end. And those two recommendations uh, will you'll I'll get the written response because it was too short of a turnaround by the time I made them and when Chief Hall said they were going to incorporate them. Uh, and I have his email to confirm that they're going to do that. Thank you. Uh, and right out of the gate to show as far as transparency, doing my best to try and enhance transparency with the community. The first thing I did is reach out to every one of the council members to say, hey, we are available one-on-one -on -one and to attend your community meetings. And uh, I've even reached out to the council member elect, Mr. Maxwell, to let him know we're available. Uh, we take in-office appointments. We're available to seven days a week. Uh, we've addressed groups, uh, over 145 groups or events over the last three years. And every time, I'll just go forward. The next slide deals with the transparency efforts and just to show, these are some of the highlights over the last three years. Can we go to the next slide, please? We've addressed over 145 groups or events, but just to show you the effort that we try and make to do it, uh, the West Fresno Ministerial Alliance, very uh, jam-packed agenda. They were able to give us five minutes at 7 a.m. We went down and met with them for five minutes at 7 a.m. And then after the Sacramento Police Department shooting of Stephon Clark, there was a meeting at the Southwest Police and District Pastors at the uh, Rising Star Missionary Baptist Church where they were concerned about what was going on in Sacramento after Stephon Clark being shot. So they invited uh, Chief Dyer at the time, the FBI, and myself. Knowing that some of the emotions were running high, we, I attended that. I went to each one of them, with one exception of the community meetings, to elect the next police chief, and it was to, to monitor it. And if someone got up and said something that, that was very critical regarding the police department, et cetera, after the meeting, I approached them because I wanted details because I was hearing these complaints, but I wasn't seeing these complaints. And I can tell you, every person that I asked for details, and I hate to say it, one of them was a religious leader from the Northwest area, when you ask them for details, they were unable to provide the details. And I've asked several times for that same religious leader to provide me details, and his response was, this is just what I've heard. Well, 
I have to go based on fact. I can't get, go based on urban legend or what people are talking about. That. The LGBTQ issue, we had a group that wanted us to meet. We went there. Unfortunately, they couldn't get in the building. So it was in August, suit and tie. I think it was probably about 108 degrees. We did it in the parking lot because we weren't going to turn them away just because we couldn't get into the building. Bringing back broken neighborhoods to life, that was after the video of the Marietta Golding shooting was released. We were invited to address the group because they were upset based on the video, even though my assessment of that shooting had been out for over a year. So knowing it was going to be somewhat of a contentious group, we went down and I met with them. And I don't know if anyone had written or read my review. I took my review, made copies of it, handed it out, and also handed out the state law on use of force, which most in attendance had never read. So these are the things. We do not avoid confrontation, and I try and do my best to entertain any type of issues with concerns regarding the police department or my office itself. And the other ones, this is post-George Floyd. We monitored TV, radio, uh, newspaper, social media, and if someone made public comments that were overly critical of the police department, I personally, between myself or Myra, reached out to them. One was that, and I saw the demand, I carry it with me, that I should be removed because I failed to prosecute an officer. And I know we have a few attorneys on the, on the, uh, the council. I don't do criminal uh, reviews. So I met with this person. And it was, in fact, June 18th when they were painting the street in front of City Hall to explain to them what my role is. And to this date, that person has never called me, even though I gave my business card and brochure so I could explain what my office actually does. Another was a newspaper, uh, no, it was actually a TV interview where a local pastor said he was tired of the police department planting guns and drugs on the young people and there's police corruption going on tried to meet with him. Initially, it was uh, agreed we were going to meet, and then he failed to follow through. And I will say this, there were members of the National Lawyers Guild and members of the uh, Public Defender's Office that made comments. Both those groups agreed to meet with me, and we, we sat down and had a relatively large uh, or long meeting that I thought was beneficial to both parties. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Question and, for you. Um, yes. So I think our department has a Hispanic Residence Academy. I think they do a Hmong one and different academies so that they learn about kind of our police department and so forth. Are you part of any of that, those academies? I can say, this answer your question, <laughs> Najong. I learned to say hello in Hmong. We talk to the Hmong, Hispanic, every one of them, the Hmong. Uh, we've also talked to the Sikh community, the Syrian community. So. We try and reach out to as many folks as possible. And I will say that the Hmong Residence Academy was probably one of the most uh, highly attended because there was probably close to 100 plus folks in that. And we were scheduled to do the most recent one, but unfortunately COVID. So we do do that. Thank Mr. Gliotta. Yes. Over here. Actually, you may not remember this, but the first time we met was actually when I was a resident was a part of that Citizens Police Academy. So I really appreciated that. Did you enjoy the presentation? I did. But mostly your assistant, she was a lot better. No, I'm just kidding. No, I, I, well, do, I do appreciate the information, though. No, thank and you. And answering critical questions. Thank you. Uh, next, regarding the delayed report that came out, and I, just to put some things on record. Uh, auditor, yes. is it delayed, or did you just withhold it until you thought no, it was it the was, right time? It was delayed. It was never going to be withheld. It was delayed. There's a difference in terminology there. Walk me through the difference. The I, difference I want to make sure that the public understands your explanation. The, it was never going to be retained, concealed, not disseminated. It was delayed. And the thing that I point out, and it finally someone posted on our uh, office, our Facebook page for Office of Independent Review, they admit that it was posted in my June or July report. Black and white, I expanded. Because initially, the only complaint was on two officers for an excessive force, unreasonable force. That's the only thing the public was, was waiting to see. I expanded for every uh, alleged allegation on the officers. And I put in there, the department was completed with theirs on May 20th, 2020. And right to the right of that, it said, would be released in the third quarter. And I put that out in July. No one called to ask me. And anyone that did, I explained that when it was going to be released. 
So that's actually one of the, Mr. President, is it okay if I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a one of point. the questions I actually had for you. So I dug up my old copy of the report. Sorry, it's a little tattered. You sent a supplement for the second quarter report, what, about three weeks ago? Uh, two, two weeks ago? Yes, approximately. Okay. And this is the old, so, so I heard that claim and I went and looked and lo and behold on page eight, you actually did, and I highlighted it, released when the incident occurred, the data was completed, but you put to be released in third quarter report. So if any of us actually read this, we could have called you and looked into it. Because when I emailed you on Friday after the news reports, I was pretty alarmed, the day after our council meeting. We met, what, on Monday? Yes. Okay. I just want to point that out. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. So, I, so there was no deception. And then when I was asked about it during the subcommittee meeting, I could have easily said, uh, you'll see that in two weeks, because that's essentially what it, when it came out. But I elaborated and told them exactly why it was delayed. And one thing I should point out, if you go by to, and no one's going to remember, resolution 2017-75, uh, I was hired under the resolution which said, my job was to produce an annual report. Got it. Yeah. Okay. If you talk to, I've, th it's on record. You look at any uh, police auditor where they do annual reports. Those reports don't normally come out to six to eight months after the close of the year. Mm -hmm. So I just looked at one, an annual report for 2019 it was just released September 2021, uh, 2020. So if I would have adhered to that, you wouldn't see this until June, July of next year. However, after a few months, I requested they amend the resolution because I said, it's not transparent to the community because of an officer involved shooting takes a year to investigate. Mm -hmm. And then it takes another year, 18 months for my report to come out. That incident could be yeah. as delayed as far as two and a half years before it actually becomes public. I said, no one's gonna remember. And some people yeah. may not even care. So I had them amend it to, to quarterly at my request. And if you read it, even quarterly, there is nothing in the resolution that says mm -hmm. my quarterly reports have to encompass everything within that quarter. I started doing that. Understood. Be so the, is it fair to describe it as a misunderstanding? On the public's part, yes. 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 Okay, fair yes. enough. Right. So if the resolution wants to be amended, I'm a rule follower. I hold the members of the police department to their policies and procedures that are existing. I would be expected, I, I would be held to the same uh, accountability. So if it's amended, uh, that's fair. I will adhere to that. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. So uh, that's the case. And in the previous, uh, the OIR that previously uh, was operated under basically the same policy. The only thing that was changed is annual and quarterly. And yet, if you go back and look, 24 times over that three-year period, cases were adjudicated by the police department but not included in that report. It's, it says pending. Mm -hmm. So it was 24 times and six times there were officer-involved shootings. It was never an issue with anyone with, within the public or with the administration. So it was, self, it was a self-imposed policy on my part to get everything within the quarter to be released. So, so one time out of three years, it didn't happen that way. I think it's fair to say that the national um, environment and the recent incidents have just made everybody super high, hypersensitive and a little bit of distrusting of, you know, public entities. So I think, you know, there was criticism, there was clear misunderstanding, you've clarified it, so thank you for doing that. And, and like I said, anyone that questioned me on it, I, I explained to them. So in closing, uh, basically I operated within the guidelines in which were on record, uh, 2018, 85. Uh, and if I hadn't requested the change, you actually wouldn't have seen that report till next June or July. Uh, and I, done everything I possibly could to increase the transparency of our reporting. And I will say this, every, I, I listened to the callers that you, when you had public comment mm -hmm. uh, basically last week prior to me being scheduled to this. And so I took that to heart. And a lot of them are saying that this Office of Independent Review should be modeled out of one, one of the Bay Area models. And if you look, it's probably been in existence longer than any other independent auditor they do not have access to department complaints. So if there's an officer involved shooting, unless you file a complaint, that independent auditor can't review the, the complaint, can't review the shooting. So if you look at this, if that was the, the situation here, better than 50, 60% or more, twice as many complaints would not be reviewed by this office. And I'll say this as far as transparency, 
I haven't talked to an auditor yet that has the amount of access that I have, and I've been criticized because I have so much access, access they think I'm too friendly with the police department. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you, you, darned if you do, darned if you don't. They give me access to everything possible, and if you look at my reports to other auditor reports, I'm open to crit uh, constructive criticism. Show me a report that shows as much detail on an officer-involved shooting or a use of force case that I put in mine. I basically almost put everything absent the officer's yeah. names, and I actually push the envelope at some yeah. times. Auditor, I, I think several things are true at the same time. One is you followed the rule um, and the procedures as outlined. Uh, there was clearly a misunderstanding on the timing of the release of the report. There is um, a lot more scrutiny than there previously used to be at the national and local level. And, and I think part of the challenge, even for me as a council member, even as a council member, um, I tend to be blindsided and see the videos of use of force in the media before we even see them. Because um, we tend to deal with matters and not see any of the evidence until it gets to the litigation point and settlement. Since there's um, the strong mayor form of government has all these employees reporting to the mayor uh, day to day in oversight. So um, I think the public also assumes that the council has insight and access, and I can assure the, the public that I don't have anywhere near the level of access as the auditor does, nor the mayor or city manager or police chief for you know, legal reasons. Um, so sometimes we are just as, you know, um, as surprised as they are when video pops up years after an incident occurred, years after it was described as routine and justified, years after it was in a report somewhere where you looked at it independently. So it just, I, I think there's a lot of variables that create this space in which um, we have to wrestle with things that we're seeing on TV or on social media on, on the news that surprise all of us. Sure. And to that point, you'll see my recommendation off the most recent supplemental case that I put out. I, I touched on that because they do what's called a use of force application. Anytime an officer displays force, and there's a segment in my supplemental which explains that. So I said, if there's a, a use of force application and injuries are sustained, I said, my recommendation is the sergeant that does the use of force review, review the body cam when available, because based, instead of going based solely on officer testimony, because sometimes it's, it's not because they tried to misguide it, they weren't aware everything was going on. So that's a recommendation, and the chief said that they were gonna adopt that. Perfect, I just have one question from, for you from my end, is you mentioned that 80, 8% of your recommendations have been ad adopted by the police department um, based on the response to you and your findings. How do you confirm that they were actually executed or that they are adhered to so that if you say, you know, top, stop taking three steps forward and two to the left, that six months later, they're not still taking two steps forward and two to the left? The following report, I will print the department's response verbatim how they've given it to me. Yeah. And many times by then, if there was enough time for them to amend the policy, I'll reprint the policy or the, the policy identifiers. And their policy manual is online. And sometimes it may be a simple thing as talking to an officer, if an officer I thought was a safety issue regarding a firearm, and they'll talk to them. So you'll yeah. see their response coming directly yeah. from them. I don't amend it, I don't change Perfect. it. It's not my summation. It's and it's all in their words. The change of policy is step one. The next step is implementation of that policy. Who's ultimately responsible for that policy being implemented? There is a unit within internal affairs that amends the policy, and right now the policy and procedure is uh, oversight by Deputy Chief Phil Cooley. Thank you. Those are all my questions from my end. Council President. Over. Mayor, Thank you me. have the floor. Mayor. One, to make a clarification, I have one employee, the city manager, so. She has a few more than I do. Back in 2017, when I brought this forward to the council, the, the model, I think you were the third OIR in the city of Fresno. And again, as John said earlier, the other guy lived out of town. So I made it a full-time position. He had to live in town. And one of the duties was to go out to the community and, and reach out and get to understand the community. And like John said also, he's only had one report a year. Then it was changed to 
he, on his initiative to four reports a year. And we do have a public citizens, public safety advisory board that actually reports at least once or twice a year to the council. And they've had an in, a, a role in rec making recommendations, for example, on body cameras and so on that are eventually implemented. And that uh, board does represent the diversity of the, our city. So um, it's, 2017 was a different world than 2020. So thank you, John, for your presentation. You're, you're welcome. And one of the things I did, uh, <laughs> Councilmember Member Betterfeld, I made sure I met with you and uh, Council Member Brandau, who voted against this position, to get your uh, straight up uh, exchange, and I, it went well. Yeah, and you know I want to say that uh, I appreciate the changes that the mayor has made. I think it has improved um, the position. Uh, I see uh, the importance of the uh, position. Um, and so I'm glad uh, that um, the position exists now, and I, I think it, it absolutely has tremendous um, importance. Uh, I want to say that um, my impression of you before um, all of this um, came about, you know, this uproar, was that you were a man of great integrity, and you've proved it. I mean, you've proven it, uh, Mr. Gliotta. Um, you know, I, you have attended... Uh, uh, a meeting that I had in the community. You've outlined how you've reached out to the entire community, no matter who asks, uh, when they ask, uh, you are there. Um, you put out a report that was critical of the police. As people were criticizing you, they didn't even really know your report was critical of, of the police, which is antithetical to what uh, one columnist hack at the Fresno Bee who loves to attack uh, the police and attack you on a personal level as well. I mean, his columns are worthless. His opinions are worthless. He's a big reason why the Fresno Bee is bankrupt, and he attacked you personally. And uh, you have demonstrated over and over transparency. As you said, going from one year report to four reports quarterly, uh, that's about being transparent. And so I just want to say thank you on behalf of the citizens for doing a phenomenal job. You are doing a phenomenal job. You will continue to do a phenomenal job. And there's no doubt you're independent. And that's exactly what an independent auditor is supposed to be, is independent. Uh, you have a history of, um, uh, of great integrity with your prior service uh, with the FBI and, and other organizations. And I just want to tell you, many, many people are grateful for your independence, for your transparency, for your honesty, and for the report that you provide the citizens of Fresno. And um, you know, people can criticize, should you have included in, you know, in the prior report, or shouldn't you? That that's fair, and we're all subject to criticism for every decision that we make. Uh, but I think you've been very clear as to your logic and your reasoning, and it's been clearly transparent. You were transparent when you presented it that uh, why you did it, and that was your opinion, and that's, that's being transparent. And I think that's all we can ask, is have a person of great integrity and openness and review every incident um, with a clear eye, uh, with no bias, with no bias leanings towards the police or not towards the police, um, and you do that, and you do that every time. And I want to thank you, and we appreciate it. Thank you. I just add... One thing, I know yeah. people, another criticism, they think I rubber stamp things, et cetera. You go back 30 years, at least 30 years, there was only one time the Fresno Police Department was charged in a civil rights violation for excessive force. Not that I'm bragging about it, but it was back from an incident in 2005, and it was an FBI investigation, and I was the FBI supervisor here at that time. So if I identify some wrongdoing, I will proceed no matter, and then, there was several since then, when I was executive manager over the FBI over this area, where it was Fresno Police Department two other times. And not that I relish in doing that, but if you identify someone doing something wrong, uh, not upholding the trust of the community, it will be addressed. Thank you for that reassurance. Any other comments, Council Member? Well, you kind of answered a question, uh, uh, Audit, uh, Mr. Gugliotta, that I was gonna ask about your previous work with the FBI, and if you've ever had to put uh, charges put people in jail that committed that violated the public's trust, like politicians or 
um, police officers. So, you know, it's really, really important, and I, I think it's fair to say that this council takes corruption very seriously, whether it's an individual that's elected to serve and takes an oath, or it's a sworn first responder. And I'm very confident that you are going to be that extra layer on top of internal affairs, a district attorney, a grand jury, and having an independent police auditor. Because I remember the day they were fighting for one, and it was difficult to get one. Like the day they were fighting for body-worn cameras. And it turns out it's actually some of the best things that ever happened to increasing transparency. But you have a very difficult job because anybody can go on the internet and be a keyboard cowboy, or anybody can make a statement they, they believe, and it's their right to freedom of speech. But unfortunately, words can hurt. Now, if someone does something wrong, we have to get to the root of it and stop it. But some of those statements that you talked about before, about planting drugs or guns, that's very serious. That's a serious charge. So I think when we have to take responsibility for our community, not just expecting you to do it, but for us to do it as well. So unless we know something happened, we should be very, very careful. It's like the, the person who cried wolf. At some point, people won't believe us anymore. So I really appreciate you taking the initiative and trying to go to the source of those tweets and those comments and say, if you've heard about this, I'm accessible. Tell me. I'll look into it. And that, that, that I think, is the true role of an independent police auditor. And if you want to comment on that. Well, I agree. I carried a badge for 30 years. The last thing I want to see is someone tarnishing that badge, no matter if it's a local cop, uh, state cop, uh, federal agent. Uh, I hate to say it, I considered Keith Foster a friend of mine. And when that case was presented to me as the executive manager of the FBI, I thought there was two Keith Fosters in the police department because I didn't think it was the same one. So it was a difficult decision, but a decision we had to make. And it was one that, you know, I won't hesitate if I come across something similar to that in my reviews. And I, let me, I think we all support that. All of us, every one of us uh, does not want to have a police officer who tarnishes the badge. They have a tremendous responsibility. You know it better than anybody. To put on that badge and have that kind of power uh, is a tremendous responsibility. And we only want the best of the best. And I have no doubt when you see something, should you see something, you will report it. You will say it in your report, as you should, and as we expect, and as the city of Fresno expects you to do, you'll do it. Because we all share the same belief. We want the absolute best uh, colorblind uh, police. There should be no, no, no bias, no implicit bias. Um, everybody should be treated exactly equally under the law, everyone. And uh, should that be found that that's not the case, that needs to be rooted out. And uh, I believe that you will continue to do that and be independent in your, in your judgment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I would agree with my colleagues that uh, when we provide somebody the authority to deadly force, that we should hold them to the highest standard of oversight and accountability. Because ultimately, policing is a public being asked to police. And um, the responsibility and the burden to utilize deadly force and take a life is the highest one that's available to any public servant. And as such, we should not be scared of ensuring the oversight and the accountability when that oath is violated for any reason, um, we, ought, we ought to enforce it because um, our police, our officers, our firefighters, our, our city staff, they have a heavy lift, everybody does. And, and I think they do the best they can and we all need to make sure that we're all equally accountable for, for doing the best we can every single day with the tasks that we're given. So thank you for the time. Thank you. Um, for the general public, this is a workshop which is designed to be a study session for the City Council. Um, so we will not be taking any public comment on this matter since there is no action to consider. Again, um, we have scheduled a heavy, heavy calendar in addition to doing a second series of budget hearings this year um, and a full council meeting today. We also wanted to dive deeper into the oversight of the police auditor and his operation because it's that important for our city. Um, with that, Council, if um, uh, we have one more item to go through before we go into closed session, that is returning to the budget hearings. We have one last, last budget to um, review. That is our folks at the pension system. 
who are requesting more money from the city's budget. So um, come on down. Like it's, um, what's that game they, they used to play on TV? Make you come down the price, aisle. The price is right. Yeah, the price is right. Come on down, but there's no money to have, so let's not, let's not over ask. Good afternoon, Mr. President, council Can members. Can you speak closer to the mic just because I know you're taller, you can raise that podium. The pension is, is so important to us that we want to hear you clearly. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Well, good afternoon, Mr. President, council members. How may I help you? We'd like to know um, in the budget um, that was provided by staff, there is, in my view, a significant increase in the uh, obligations and contributions for the pension fund. We'd like to understand why it is that the pension system is asking for more money at this time. From my elementary understanding, the uh, stock market has been amazing thanks to Council President Bredefield's president, Trump. Um, so I'm not um, understanding why it is that uh, the pension system is asking for higher contributions from the city coffers. Would you like the short answer or the former college professor answer? <laughs> Let's okay. try the guy who can't balance his checkbook answer first. Uh, that would be California Government Code 7501 through 7504, which requires all public pensions in California to use an actuary and act on their recommendations. That would be Fresno Municipal Code 3-305, which the council passed many years ago, which requires the pension boards to use those actuaries and then change the contributions on an annual basis. That would be Chapter 3-505, which has the other pension board held to the same standard. As so to the markets, yes, they are very well, uh, doing very well, uh, but it's also based a lot on a rolling average, not just this year. What would be the ro rolling average? Because the markets have been performing very well for at least 10 years. Uh, actually, President Obama had a better stock market gain than President Trump did. Let's just make that record clear. So if we're gonna talk about the horses. President Obama was a much stronger horse for the stock market. What is that rolling average, please? I don't have that number with me. But Can they, you get back to us? Absolutely. They, city, city, uh, they uh, use a smoothing, which is, goes back over a long period of time. It takes into account booming markets. It takes into account the years that go down. It used to be 8.5% when I came here was the presumed rate. It's currently 7%, is that correct? Or seven yes, and a quarter? Mr. Mayor. yes, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and that is based on these rolling averages over a period of time. The methodology has been proven pretty successful. If I may interrupt, that actual assumed rate of return is based on forward-looking expectations, not the rolling average looking backwards. So you've got multiple things, and it's about to get very long-winded, and I apologize. The, I will. Uh, the uh, actuary looks at the actual life expectancies of the employees. They look at what's changed over time. They look at the promises that have been made in MOUs. They look at the promises that have been made by the salaries increasing. Does the pension system have enough assets to pay based on what the Fresno Municipal Code requires? Then they look at the investment return assumptions. Then they look at the rolling average, as the mayor pointed out. So they're looking at multiple items. Can, can you just provide the council exactly what numbers you're using to determine your actual aerials? Well, that was provided to the council January 16th, the system's um, employees retirement system adopted a contribution of uh, an average of 13.03 from a 11.11, is that what you're asking? The fire and police blended tiers went from 19.59 to 22.82. So there was approximately a 3%, 4% increase in what you anticipate as the city's contribution to the pension fund? I believe that's what is required, but yes, sir. Is that um, for this year, or is that going forward, and if so, how many years? Fiscal year 21. It's an annual thing. Okay. Um, is there any variables that you control that would reduce the rate of increase? Uh, unfortunately, um, I am not in charge of the stock markets, so no, sir. No? It would be us, then. We would have to do it from our end in terms of um, l negotiated labor agreements? That would be something for the council to consider, but... Not under my purview. Okay, fair enough. Council President, there's a board. There's one for public safety and one for all the other employees that's composed of 
management and employees. They meet as part of your retirement board, correct? Uh, the pension boards. The pension board, yes. Yes, both meet um, several times a month. I'm unsure what you're asking, Mr. Mayor. And they, don't they make the recommendations on the uh, the rates? And the they adopt those recommendations, yes, sir. All right, okay. And the, the, the employees, they are very well trained. I remember, I forgot the name of the fireman that was on there for a number of years. He's a tall guy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay. I, from my perspective, I have what I need. I don't know if there's any questions from the rest of the council. Thank you. All right, seeing none. Thank, thank you, you very much. Is there, um, before you go, um, is there any members of public wishing to comment on the pension portion of the city's budget? Seeing none, we'll come back. Thank you, Mr. Um, Keller. Yes, sorry. No worries. Thank you. Thank Mr. you for coming. Council, before we end this budget hearing, I do want to give the council an opportunity to make some final budget motions. Um, if you don't have any, I have a couple I'd like um, to be considered. One is a motion to set aside $1 million uh, to begin the process of implementing the recommendations by the Fresno Commission on Police Reform, which um, you should receive a tentative draft tomorrow. Is there a second for that motion? <laughs> the mayor second the motion. It's a, mo it's a million dollars set aside for the recommendations of the Police Commissioner Reform. So I'll second it. All right, second by Member Sparza. And my second motion is to fund um, $250,000 from the Public Works Department to fund the truck route study needed for the South Industrial Triangle. Um, the airport has set aside up to half a million. The county needs to set aside a portion, and our portion um, should probably be around 250000 so we can continue to push the plans through to um, open up that area for um, commercial industrial development. So Second. There, all right. Second by Member Chavez. Those are the last two motions I have for this budget process. Council, Any others? Council President, um, Council we get President. to make motions up to the day of the vote. Is that I am hoping, Council, that um, we can do as many motions as possible today so that staff has the weekend to work through. Um, we did schedule Friday as a potential day for budget motions and a council meeting. Um, we do have it on the calendars if ne necessary, but so far I don't see it necessary unless the council chooses otherwise. With the council, does the council feel necessary to come back tomorrow for an another round of budget hearings and motions? None? We had set aside Friday as tentative. Oh, the 20th. Uh, the no, 20th no, would be an opportunity no, to vote on all the motions, correct? Next Tuesday? We could always, uh, if, you know, I don't think tomorrow is necessary, but if there is going to be uh, a motion by a uh, council member and they uh, anticipate it, they could at least send it to staff, not to the council, obviously, that has to be done in public, but maybe send it over to the administration, that way they can work it in and they aren't blindsided. I'm not sure if that's a potential solution. That sure. Way we can yeah. um, all right, council, then this completes the budget hearing uh, for today. The next time the council sure. will meet is on October 20th to vote on the motions at 9 a.m. And then of course we meet on October 22nd for the next council meeting and potentially a vote on the final budget. With that, we will now convene to closed session. Legal counsel, what's on the closed session agenda? Yes, my understanding is the real property negotiation has been... It's been tabled to next week. For next week? Yes. And the evaluation... Council President? I'm sorry. Yes, uh, Council you're President, right. This is Henry Piero, uh -huh. Budget Manager. May I ask a, a point of clarification on your last motion? Yes. You, you, you motioned for, is it 250000 Yes. And what was the funding source? The Public Works Budget. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and I'll email those out to everyone. Perfect. So, Council, we will not do evaluations today. Um, we will do the legal cases on the agenda, and if we have time, we'll get to the real estate negotiations. All right, so on the agenda, we have real property negotiation concerning the listed APN. Also, Laura versus City of Fresno, uh, Lexington versus City of Fresno, uh, public security, and also a potential litigation, City of Fresno versus Shannon. 
do we an an we don't anticipate any action to report out. So staff, get ready for the legal cases and then uh, potentially real estate negotiations. Thank you all and see you and your respective offices for closed session.